Good morning, fellow citizens. Welcome back to the Citizens Chat Show. My name is Masesa Demiano, your host. And today, uh, since we are nearing into, into swearing in, just a few days from now, we are taking stock of the 35 years of uh, President Museveni's uh, tenure in, uh, in, uh, in rule, and also with a special focus on the 10 points program. Uh, joined on the panel today is, uh, is uh, an interesting uh, panel of guests that uh, we'll have uh, time to, to engage with. But allow me to take you into context of our, of our debate today. Uh, the changes that took place in Uganda in January 1996 are seen by some as ushering in a, of a new era. The leader of the new regime, Yorim Seven, indeed declared that what took place in January was merely a change of God, but, re uh, but represented a more fundamental change. So uh, we need to discuss uh, the 35 years yeah, going down. And uh, on the panel today, uh, from uh, my far uh, right, uh, Joseph Ocheno. Welcome back, Joseph. And uh, always good to be here. Yes, uh, on short notice again, you you That's showed okay. up. Yeah, Joseph is uh, is uh, of course UPC and uh, a presidential uh, contestant under UPC. Yes. Uh, then we have uh, Robert, Dr. Robert Ojambo. is uh, the dean of uh, political hey, science. Hey. Yes. Head. Head. Uh, okay. History and political sciences at uh, Chambogo University. Welcome back, uh, Joseph. You, uh, you've, uh, Robert, you've been here before. Thank yes. Uh, then uh, Sarah Birete, Executive Director with the Center for Constitutional Governance, uh, a regular panelist with us. Welcome, Thank Sarah. Thank you, Damien. Yes. And uh, Advocate uh, Matanda Abubakar. He prefers to be to, to be called the advocate now. He's trying to, to, to change his profiling. So <laughs> congratulations. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> and uh, finally I have uh, Mary Mutasi. Also advocate. Uh, advocate. Oh yes. Uh, yeah, and a political pastor. analyst, a pastor. Oh yes. And uh, oh, she's also right. director of international relations with uh, Afro Arab, yeah, yes. Youth Council. Yeah, well, thank you very much uh, thank you, thank for, you. for showing up. It's uh, a pleasure. And yeah, she was telling me that uh, getting off politics was uh, is, is not easy. So she she finds herself getting back in the circles. I'm telling you, yeah. that, <laughs> so, that <laughs> demon is very strong. Have got off? She can't get off. That's what uh, never forgets its path. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Uh, digging straight into into the discussion today, mm -hmm. and uh, possibly I'll start from here. Yes. It's not out of bad manners that because you sat close to me, but uh, for 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 the debate and also uh, for for context. I was uh, about to say it's dangerous to sit near. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, what is your general overview of the 35 years of uh, President um, Seven going into the, his seventh term that we we were expecting in the, in the, the few days? Uh, Sarah Ringin slated on the 12th of uh, next week. What's your Genova view of uh, 35 years of his uh, tenure? Well, um, it's um, quite a chunk to, to, to ably summarize in a few statements. But for starters, I would say that when we, we, we focus majorly on the 10 point program as your, your, your uh, highlight of that discussion was saying, uh, personally, I think it was a good diagnosis. Yeah. When it comes to uh, ably identifying the challenges or problems of Uganda at that time, I think President Museven and the group, they were, they, 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 they scored, they were excellent on that that even after uh, 35 years, we, we still, you find that the country is still draining around that. They remain the same challenges, although they, they've changed in the form and substance <coughs> over the years. Of course, um, they are scores. Uh, there are certain things that the government has gotten right. Uh, when you look at the period from uh, 1990 uh, to around 10 years, 
the, 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 the government, the, the leadership was um, actually doing exactly what they came to do. Not to say that beyond that they did not try to, 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 to answer to <coughs> the challenges that they based on to come. But I think for starters, when you look at the 10 points of program, democracy and security, you could see that the, the team, the leadership by then, that the adjustments in organization and structures of society were well intended. Now, it is another debate as to whether over the years the leadership has kept on to that, to date. Of course, as society evolves, as there are transformations, as there are changes in the demands of the population and even the demographics themselves, of course, priori uh, priorities and preferences have changed. New challenges are, have come on. Now, it is a litmus test for the leadership um, as to whether they can live up to the bid of the current dynamics. So in, in very few statements to me, that is how I view it. That along the way, of course, um, the challenges have also turned into challenges also for the leadership. For example, um, uh, when you look at their projection of, of how Uganda should be brought out of what they felt was a dead um, edge to now Raim as one of the, the, the countries that matter in Africa and the world over. Uh, when you look at, at their um, uh, 10 point program, you discover that the, the, the leadership was on point and um, not to repeat myself, they did the right diagnosis as to whether the strategies deployed along the way to answer to that are right strategies that is a debate. Ah, thank you very much, uh, Mary, and uh, for, for, for that uh, overview. I need to get to, to um, Matanda. I don't know. Uh, I, I thought that, you are going to cross. To uh, I'm not following. Yeah. <laughs> 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 35 years. I know it sounds so, 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 so much. I, and, uh, we, <laughs> we, we, we need to have uh, the youth perspective in this. But uh, just uh, 12th uh, of, this, of uh, this month, we swear, um, President Museveni is swearing in. And uh, he'll be into his seventh term. What is your overview of the 35 years? I know you, you, you've not been there. Just give us a scope <laughs> of uh, the few years that you've been around. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, uh, Damian. Um, uh, once again, I'm very happy to be here in this very senior panel. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a privilege. With historicals. Yes, <laughs> with, 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 with the historicals. And um, maybe let me start with a story. I was running through my archives of Uganda's history, and I landed on a speech uh, given by President Yoweri Kakuta Museven in Gulu uh, in 1989. And he started that speech with an apology. He said, uh, people of Acholi, I'm very sorry that I have to address you in English like a colonial agent. Uh, but please bear with me. This is because as a country, we just wasted, he called them 24 years of, of, of bad governance and, and bad leadership. Uh, but now, <laughs> with uh, strategic leadership challenges not with this standing, uh, these things we are going to fix. So I remember watching our good president campaigning in Guru, in this previous election. And he was addressing <laughs> the people of Acholi sub-region in English. <laughs> How many years later? <laughs> 34 years later. Previously, I was talking about 24 that we, we, we had wasted. <clears throat> I just want to use that story to say, uh, as a, a young person, I was born in 1990. 
<laughs> for for years, <laughs> for, for, <laughs> for years after the, the fundamental change had been declared, the president, by the way, said in, in that statement, he said, I think this is a fundamental change. I don't know whether people pay yeah. the attention to the yeah, diction. Yeah. Mm. He said, I think. That's what I've been telling yeah. people. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. It's not a mere uh, change of God. Yes, I think it's a fundamental change. So, to, to cut the long story short, uh, to be fair, I think that well, comparatively when you look at Africa and you look at the region uh, where we, we live as a country, as, as, as Uganda, you look to the west, uh, you look to the north, uh, elements in the south, uh, to, to the credit of the NRA, and when you look at that 10-point program, security, I think appears twice, the second point and the third point we are all talking about security. I think there are some gains uh, as a country that we have made from this leadership in terms of uh, stability. Never mind that there could be turbulence uh, under the water, but a semblance uh, of stability, uh, which, which I think is credit in the context of the sub-region, the Great Lakes. Uh, sub-region within which we exist. Uh, but as a young person, I think that my generation right now is more interested in number one, uh, prosperity, uh, being productive. I, I would think that right now, Uganda would be discussing uh, issues, matters, economics, productivity. And when you look at the fifth point on, on, on that list, the aspiration was to have an independent, mark those words, integrated and self-sustaining national economy. <clears throat> ah, when I look at all indicators right now without massaging them, uh, I, I don't see anything close to that. And yet, in my view, and as a young person, for me, that is the most important because, of course, we cannot just talk about stability for 34 years. I mean, our neighbors to the south and, 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 and to the east have equally been stable. But like, it's possible to, to be stable, so it's not something you can sing forever. Eventually, you have to move from stability to something more. And in my view, I think that something more would be an independent, <laughs> integrated, and self-sustaining national economy uh, that I think we are very far from. But more than that, earlier on you hinted that, uh, um, I don't know how to call her my sister or a land friend here, when you said she, she intimated that she has tried to move away from politics, but not very successfully. I should tell you, personally, I feel, uh, you, you, you didn't mention that I'm the National Youth Coordinator of ANT. Mm. I am, so I'm in politics. But I'm telling you I'm in politics begrudgingly. I think that my efforts in politics now are efforts that Uganda is losing. I should be making a contribution to this country in other areas, say maybe legal jurisprudence or issues of intellectual property, issues of human rights. But the reason why I'm in politics is because for some reason, since 1962, we have failed as a country to fix once and for all the questions of governance. Simple questions of being able to organize our governance structure, because the first point, interesting, it is democracy. Uh, never mind that sometimes I hear people speaking for the NRM and the NRA bashing democracy and saying this is a Western uh, ideal, or sometimes when we remind them about excesses, like uh, what is in, in our Bill of Rights, the, the human rights, they say, ah, no, those things are not applicable, these are Western things, and then I ask them, but you put this as number one <laughs> on your 10-point program. Could, could that maybe suggest that your diagnosis, and earlier on, uh, Ms. Mute said the diagnosis was proper, could the, the continuous description of democracy as a Western ideal and, 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 and those who profess ideals of democracy as agents of imperialism, could that, that point to or, or signal that the diagnosis were not proper, 
Because if, if, if they are now arguing that democracy is not good, maybe we need another form of governance, could that mean they got it wrong at that time, or is it pretends to mention it as one of the four principles of NRA? So my biggest quarrel with the NRA, NRM uh, leadership is one, the failure to fix uh, questions of governance, that even things like political contestation, we, are just, we just came out of an election. I had an opportunity to move with my presidential candidate across the country, but it could easily pass for a war, uh, a, a, a war zone or, or time, we, we, you know, we, with the tankers, with, 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 with all kinds of reprises and altercations with security agencies. But that, that's just one strand. We're talking about political contestation and participation. So my first quarrel is on questions of governance. And in governance, of course, it is very broad, but you could look at contestation. We could look at having a stable transition. This country since independence, we say this over and again, has never seen a peaceful transfer of power from one leader to another. So every time we go into an election, people run to the villages, people run out of the country, capital uh, flies out of the country, because you are never sure what's about to happen. These are things that I would think that by now, they would be part of our history. Things like political persecution. So many young people now are in prison for none other than just expressing a different opinion, you know, uh, about what is happening in the country. These are things that I think our motion is backwards. Like if you made one step forward, then you make three steps backwards. Mm -hmm. So on governance, my second quarrel and, 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 and final biggest quarrel with the regime is on the economy. I think if there is anything, this government has got completely zero it's on the question of the economy. Uh, just one example, the issue of household income. Interestingly, the leader of, of that so-called revolution likes talking about household income and, and, and transformation of the people and people having some money in the pocket. If you had to just look at and count the number of programs we have had, now we are talking about a parish model. Yeah, at some point, uh, there are so many. NADS, a MIOGA a program for modernization of agriculture, prosperity for all, which I think is Bonabaga Gawale. All those interventions for youth, for women, all of them have ended up just becoming cash cows. All of them, if you look at all of them, all you see is try and error. So I think that this regime has failed almost entirely on coming up with a national program that seeks to transform the economy and like the, the, the fifth program described it, put it in the hands of the nationals, uh, have an economy that's independent. You know in this country almost do not have any primary industry. A lot of what we call industries, many of them are assembling plants and warehouses. If you, you look for what we are producing as a country, you can find, hardly find anything. If you look for the biggest taxpayers, the top three taxpayers in the country, uh, the, 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 cap the companies, the individuals are not Ugandan. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the general uh, policy framework and, and, and atmosphere in the country, I was hoping that Mr. Morrison Rakakamba would be here. I, I learned recently that he's the chairperson of the Uganda Investment Authority. If you look at the attitude to investors, attitude to foreign investors vis-a-vis -vis the attitude to local investors, the preference is clear. So I think in those two areas, it, it, it has been a mess. But uh, not to, 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 to just trash everything, let me end on the note that I started of, of uh, giving some credit. I think there was something good in having some points. I generally, I mean, had 18 points. Then <laughs> I distilled those into 10. I think it's a good thing, and for my generation, if we can learn anything from that group, because these were largely young people at the time, I think it's important to have an agenda. That, that's a good thing. I think currently, mm -hmm. I see my colleagues in politics, the young people, many of us run for positions, and many of us are organizing around other than any ideas. So even if you just throw there a piece of paper with scripted some ideas, it's a good place to start. Thank, Thank you, you very much, uh, Matanda. You have a lot of uh, frustration at uh, 
at this uh, a few three times or four times into President Museveni. I don't know what I said. I possibly. I don't know those who have enjoyed more, who have been around more would say. Yes. Sir, sir, seven, yes, seven, yes. seven times to the seventh time, and uh, I don't know how many you you've uh, <coughs> been around. No, no, no. But I think I've been around for quite some time, mm. and I qualify to be. A <laughs> 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 I qualify to be a senior citizen because uh, President Museven came to power when I was in primary four. <laughs> <laughs> Were you using a pen yet or still using a pen? I was so running <laughs> out to use a pen. <laughs> <laughs> so given that time, you know when you mention it now, it sounds like Stone Age. And it makes, you know, our children get suspicious as to whether we are not in the 70s <laughs> <laughs> instead of our 40s. <laughs> because they don't understand, you know, how one person can be in power for all this time. So, and, and I've listened to, to my young brother, Baker, struggling to, to justify you know, for 35 years, even if you had the most terrible president, they would achieve some things. Even in a bad marriage, there are children, there are days when you find a hot meal. So, but I don't think whether you should celebrate that vis-a-vis -vis your own well-being, mm -hmm. that after all this marriage has children and I can eat a hot meal once in a while, and you think that is enough to keep you in a marriage. There is more to a marriage than a hot meal and children. So you, we don't need to, to feel guilty or to, to be able to justify that some things have been done without setting timelines. Because 35 years, these are three generations of leaders. Our primary framework in the Constitution, in the constitution was that the maximum a, a, a person should be a president is 10 years. So we are looking at President Museveni occupying space of four presidents in this country, taking more than 50% of our independence as a nation, because we are going into 59 years of independence. Yes, and you have 35. So you, he has led this country for, yeah, above 60% of our independence period. So if you cost the little achievements that are there vis-a-vis -vis time, I think the most remarkable achievement that President Museven has pulled off is keeping himself in power for this long. As at, at what cost to, to the nation and to the citizens, we have all felt the effect of this. We have a, a permanent presidency who has appointed, I don't know how many chief justices, because you need to cost leadership vis-a-vis -vis the tenets of governance. If you say you are running an independent, you know, the, the doctrine of separation of powers, and you have an individual who is larger than all national institutions in the country, now all the judges in our judicial system have all been appointed by the president by virtue of his wrong stay. So you need to ask yourself, I know when you compare with the you know, developed the democracies, they look at the composition of Supreme Court and they are like, which regime appointed these people? Which regime? And there is a balance to say at least every president should appoint some two, three judges to the Supreme Court. But over 35 years, you have the whole judiciary appointed by one person. You have a parliament that cannot take a decision unless they've been summoned to state house and told what to say, or Changwanzi. You have MPs or leaders at several levels who think that they need to do so much to attract the attention of the Supreme Leader. Yet, you know, the, the, the only country that officially has the title of a Supreme, Supreme Leader, I think, is Iran. <laughs> In, in their, yeah, in their yeah, national yeah. architecture. But by design, we now have a supreme leader 
whose every other person is struggling to attract attention. You know, he has become like a same God. He determines matters of life and death. If he decides that you will be poor, you are here will force five taxes. The courts, they can be told what to do. They, you, and, 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 and you are done. We have seen how opposition leaders are, are, are treated. Even when, let me use the most recent example, the, the Bob Wine breadproof vehicle. You take it in the system, but because they don't know the owner, they verify and levy taxes and you pay. Then tomorrow when the owner is known, then it becomes a contentious issue that even attracts court to say that the car was for, forced, you know, taxed. Who forced the taxed it in the first place and why? And the Ugandan is asking those critical questions. So because the owner is not known, you pay no more tax. But because the owner happens to be an opposition leader, then you pay three times more than the original tax you paid. And, it, and then this is the country that we are talking about. If you want today to start a bus company and you go like Ochieno is known as a UPC leader, it's a nightmare. It's a, and we need to discuss these questions without you know, feeling that the, it is our burden. No, it is our burden, yes, as citizens. But when we keep quiet, it will become a bigger burden for our generations and the future of this country. So this is the nature of the country, and this is the nature of the funda so-called fundamental change. So does it seem fundamental to anybody? I do not think so. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> right in there. <laughs> Dr. Jambo, you, you, are, you are a lecturer of, uh, of uh, history and uh, political science. 35 years, how do you weigh in? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Damian. Uh, I normally keep this in class, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad today. This is civil, been, civil space. So I've been <laughs> given <laughs> some <laughs> more space yeah, really. to speak to some viewers who don't attend my classes, mm. because unfortunately for this country, these days to attend my my classes, mm. you have to pay, mm. yeah. and hugely. You have to pay. Me, myself, I didn't pay. Oh, good. Uh, otherwise, I would have not. Damian mm. knows where mm. I come from. Mm. I wouldn't have stepped in a university mm. uh, if it was this time. Mm. Mm. Uh, I want to give you a historical perspective. You know, a country gets a leader who mirrors the people. Whom he or she leads. And it comes from a huge environment. When we got independence in 1962, Uganda was on track on many things. For some of you who have time and can go to the archives and read, there was a time when Uganda was one of the leading exporters of coffee and cotton. And because of those two items, the dollar, <laughs> you got the, 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 the United States dollar, was of less value of the Uganda shilling. You cannot believe. You can just go and check at the archives at, at Wandegea and you will be amazed. Because at that time, what you exported really determined your economic value. And at that time, I know we had just the big things that had happened to Uganda was the Owen Falls Dam and the Mulago Hospital, what people call New Mulago. In fact, it was inaugurated in 1960 by the Queen. And I think it has remained the only hospital that you can talk about in Uganda. Everybody wants to go to Mulago. For what reasons, I don't know. Then we went on up to 1964. Problems started. Parochial and other issues came in, personal interest. And 1966, boom, we were in a crisis. So since 1966, Uganda has been meandering in its political terrain. And Yoweri Museveni has been one of the problem and the benefactor. From 1970s to 1966, 
he was one of the major problems of this country. Uh, if you go back to the records, you read how they were really uh, declaring him as a, a, a terrible criminal when he was in Luero. Fortunately, 1986, he's the president. But before that, he had been a vice president of the Army Council in 1980. So people normally think that Museven came from a, a common person uh, mistaken. That's why I don't even believe in the story of the 27 guns. Because Museven had led an army of Fronasa of 5,000 men. And I don't, I don't see any record where people that army was disbanded because in mm. 1980 yeah. all those armies were incorporated and they don't record how those guns were collected back and returned to the state of Uganda. So 27 is really to show us a superstar story. Uh, so uh, ca coming from there, coming from there, uh, in 1986, as my colleagues have already stated, and uh, I like Mutesi for her dynamism. Uh, she's always a very dynamic person and talks about things the way they are. I thank you, my sister. So 1986, uh, at the door of parliament, the president uh, stated uh, a speech which was best recorded by BBC and the writers. It was the writing and the audio by BBC. He said so many things, but one of the biggest statements, he said, this is not a mere change of God, I think it is a fundamental change. And he said so many things, and later <coughs> it is that that NRC sat and produced what they call a 10-point program. Viewers and listeners, as a young man, this was my question to pass exam at the university. Uh, because for us students of history, this is what we are doing when we are studying the history of Uganda and would look at each one of them from democracy to the last one. Uh, my then teacher, Okalany, is now an old man, retired to Teso, uh, he used to really ask us, and he would give us an example, that he, when he was a young man in Teso, uh, there were so many people from Teso going to school, and the only reason was that they had a lot of cattle. You just go to a cattle market, sell, and you take your child. And he was very proud of about three schools. In fact, for him, he believed that they were the only schools, Teso College, Aloyet, and Nabumari. Hi. So from there, he went to Makerere and later went to other places. He was our teacher. So he would be the one teaching us. So he, he, he was a living, a living, a living, a, a living library because he had seen all these things. So fundamental change and then 10-point program, because that's what we have been requested to discuss here. I think I want to be fair to the president. In 1986, he was not sure. Because a mere fact saying he thought, I think, he also, he was not sure. But what he was very sure about was that he had become the leader and he thought it would change things. Maybe the other thing I want to bring in perspective was the timing. At that time, Africa was just healing from the Cold War. And in the Cold War, you had to show whether you were on the left or in the west. And Uganda had really struggled to see where they belong. At first, our leaders had declared that they were non-aligned. But my senior colleague, Mao tell, normally tells us that you can never be neutral. And he says, if you find anybody standing on the fence, just shake, he will choose where to fall. <laughs> so majority of the people who called themselves non-aligned were people who prophesied a socialist feeling. But they didn't want to show, because it was dangerous to declare that you supported the socialist bloc at that time the West would really deal with you. Yoweri Museveni seems to have been a very good scholar of, of the socialists, but he, of course, also hiding in there. And therefore, when he came, he really came up with the things that would do, 
really identify him. And socialism was really very common in, uh, I mean, popular in Africa because it looked like the African uh, way of doing things. Yeah. And Nyerere is the one who really explains this further when he comes up with his ujama, ujama thing. Uh, ujama is what she's saying here, Ubuntu. Uh, or, or, or something which is Burundi, Bwansi, like what we have in the Buganda here. So uh, uh, those ten-point program were crafted on that basis: self-sustaining economy, democracy, unity, and so on and so forth. And uh, 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 at that time, really, you needed to sympathize with the president because he didn't know what his future would be. Uh, for those who can remember, for us we read, because I was a, a, a little young man in P3, she was, she was in P4, I was in P3. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, we, we, we used to see the president as a man of the people, the one who is written about in the novel, mm -hmm. a man of the people, uh, uh, driving on streets of Kampala, buying things in local markets, not supermarket and he believing in really a common man empowering himself. Uh, I think with the time, uh, they say power corrupts. Slowly it started corrupting him, and I really agree with her, her, her analysis of things. The first 1986 to 1990, tick, anybody would vote for him, if you are really reasoning. My first time to vote was 1980. Uh, 1996, and uh, I almost voted him. I almost. But uh, <laughs> there were three things on that uh, on his uh, poster. There was peace, unity, and modernization. I looked at peace. I gave it a tick. We were somehow a semblance of some society moving to peace. Uh, modernization, I doubt it. Unity, I doubt it. And you will still see as we keep on moving on those two, there has been a problem. Because that's what breaks into those uh, ten point program. There are those three uh, major words. So, if uh, Faris Mutibwa was to write a book today, Mutibwa wrote a book, uh, Uganda after independence, a story of unfulfilled hope. And in his book, I may not, I may invite you to read it, he seems to think that Uganda started in 1986. Yeah. That's when now the hope starts to, because in 1986 there was, a, after that in 1989 there is a talk of NRC and then the constitution and people were saying, yeah, this is the thing. And uh, right now, there is a paper I've written, I don't know whether it is already, uh, it is to be published, and is trying to analyze our constitution. And for me, I am arguing, I don't know whether the lawyers on this bench will agree with me, it is a, do, a tool for dictatorship. The 1995 constitution, in my view, in my humble view, is a tool for dictatorship. Good man you are. Because dictatorship does not need people in guns to be mauling people and killing them, and because that's what we have been meant to understand as dictatorship. Dictatorship is assumption of power without question. That's what I call dictatorship in my view. And when you look at that constitution, I recently I was talking to Omar Atubo, he's now an old man, he was the CA. And I talked to Miriam Matembe. Sometimes I, I, I respected that uh, old mom of mine, but I fault <laughs> her that she was in the CA. She was in the CA, and for Miriam Matembe, was a commissioner. Oh, the Dutch commissioner. You know they were commissioners. Mm -hmm. They were not just these mm -hmm. common people. <laughs> and those are the ones who would be briefed on what to Gandhi sell in the in the in the in the in the con in the in the conference and the, the constitution comes out and it is giving power removing power from ugandans and giving it to one person all those articles look at them one by one with the exception of maybe the 
the, the chapter 4 chapter 4 which talks about uh, rights and uh, be, be the, our bill of rights for Uganda's case the rest of those the yeah. president must be mm. the person the president and therefore anybody who becomes the president in Uganda and we are using that constitution will be like you M7 whether you like it or not in my view because it gives him a lot of power is that what has he created this unfulfilled hope I don't think so I think it is just because of uh, no agenda. We have been running a, a country without any agenda. We run a country to see what we benefit from it. And all our leaders, I will not, uh, I will not, uh, I will not save any. Because I've said for me the things I normally say them in class, I don't bring them out here. They have been struggling for that. What do I get from the country? Not what do I give to the country? So the first one was democracy, and all of you, in simple terms, Abraham Lincoln uh, simplified for us what democracy is. You don't want to go to the school of law like these landy uh, colleagues of mine. They don't normally want us to call them landy <laughs> friends, but uh, okay, these advocates, <laughs> these advocates. You don't need to go to the school of law to understand democracy. Abraham Lincoln simplified it for us. The government of the people, by the people, and for the people. It's very, very important. By, for, and the other oh. third one, off, off. Simple. So that's what we expected to get from the, that uh, point number one of the 10-point program. Ladies and gentlemen listening to me there, is that the democracy that we have? Mark for yourself. I leave it at that. I want to concentrate slightly on the on the the self-sustaining economy. We shall get, get the, 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 yes, uh, Joseph. Uh, interestingly, I think you 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 experienced part of uh, this uh, before and uh, now where we are. <laughs> so kindly try to dig us into into the thirty-five years and see. I am. Uh, the fantastic elder to this panel. <laughs> <laughs> and it can get a bit difficult. <laughs> so, because uh, the equality provisions in, in, in the Constitution, for the first time I'm invoking it to protect me. That, <laughs> that as an old man I'm kept at four, since I'm soon looking for uh, uh, a right to, to, to claim a seat. A special interest in, in the National Assembly. But look, um, it is true that uh, I am very lucky because I just about managed to vote in 1980. Uh, the submissions all put in context are really, really deep. Um, sort of all explain everything. Um, what I would otherwise suggest, though, is this, that uh, the so-called 10-point program was an accident of the time for Mr. Museveni, I think has been insinuated, um, as much as Museveni is not stumbling onto power. Number two, that it is actually true that anybody who came to power and anybody who comes to power would want to, to propel, as I think one of the colleagues here suggested, it means 18 points. So Museveni really had to do it and, and list, down, uh, list down 10. Now, they were so appealing to most Ugandans, minus myself, that uh, um, to his credit, he managed to sell it. But then number three, you're absolutely right that Reuters and the BBCs and others uh, were so excited because they really wanted change. The change that would bring them uh, to their man, Museveni, where Museveni has delivered for them, that they would clean every mess with a neat brush. And as a, uh, as a as a communications practitioner, I can tell you that was basically deliberate. The BBC at the time had to sell Mr. Museveni. And also for historical and political reasons, um, yes, they needed uh, a Museveni in a way, although they were quite mixed at the time, because uh, um, uh, while UPC had not given them everything they wanted, it was not as scary as initially thought. But uh, to UPC's credit, of course, um, Obote rejected uh, Mwali Munyere's um, Ujama and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Kaunda's African Socialism. So in a very interesting way, uh, the UPC stood quite clearly, even with the Commonwealth Charter, 
proposed in, in, in the delegates conference in 1968, uh, the party clearly stood for uh, Uganda's mixed economy, which Museven hints at, at his 10th tenth, program. Clearly, this is the point. Um, the 10-point program was a seller for NRM to land in. Um, interestingly, what would have been would be to look at Mr. Museveni's manifesto for 1980, uh, uh, when he was uh, UPM. What were the programs for UPM? Why didn't he marry the UPM programs that he believed in a few years earlier to what it was necessarily as part of the 10-point program? But particularly, yes, they wanted to cleanse themselves. But if you look from the beginning, systematically, there is not one single point that these guys qualify. Now, it's not because it's a channel speaking. It's a matter of fact. You know, whether you start on democracy and you just look at the process that we just come from the last few, few months. Um, I was telling some senior Western diplomats, actually briefing them abroad about 15 years ago, and I was telling them that uh, Osebina has done a fantastic thing for UPC and most other Ugandans who were opposed to him from the beginning. That indeed up to around the time of the promulgation, or nearing the promulgation of the 1965 uh, uh, 95 constitution, for us strategists, in a way, <laughs> the opposition were saying, this guy might outspart us by doing something so nice that you know, it may just qualify that way really this terrible. But for the guy continuously kept on proving what we always said, that he was the same man. So really, um, did we need, was there a question of democracy? 1980 general elections, and I'm here with uh, Obwana, a professor, I'll call you that, and very deliberately, um, we go back to critiquing 1980 general elections. Compare 1980 general elections, including the events leading to it, including the interventions of Paul Mwang and why he intervened, because I actually saw something the other day that um, I think one of the NRM ministers saying one of the reasons why they had to intervene was because, I think it was my good elder, Rugunda, that it was to, to protect the state. If you consider what DP was doing and what they were saying and the context of whatever was happening nationally, you cannot compare 1980 general elections with any elections that NRA has held since 1996. In 1996, I told Cecilia Guell that they should actually pull off, and I was literally begging from London and <laughs> some of my members, begging them that they should pull off. But actually, this was a waste of time, because part of the argument was, should we participate in I said, look, um, I think Bangladesh had, opposition had strategically pulled off, said no, went to the streets, of course, unfortunately, the streets here, the members would come, went to the streets, no, had a national campaign, fresh elections were called, and the opposition actually won. That's what I was trying to tell Cecilia at the time. What am I saying? No democratic elections, by and large, have taken place, and after all, is it seventh term, Damien? Yes. It's not. Mr. Museveni came to power in 1986. Nobody invited him or opened him for the, the doors of State House. The election that took place in 1995 was under Article 269. With Article 269, and that's my contention with the, the likes of the Miriam Matembes, the provisions of Article 269 was basically ban on political parties. So for me, as UPC, I would not call that elections when you actually came 10 years earlier claiming that you, you, you're talking about democracy and, uh, and you've rescued Uganda uh, from uh, 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 a dictatorship. So quite clearly, that did not provide. Um, talk about the, the, the economy. I, I, I really don't want to go in and on, but I want to bring it to the, 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 the final point, uh, the, 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 the question of alleged mixed economy. I think it was Yang Machanda who talked about it, and I think all my colleagues mentioned it. It is just amazing, I was looking through the whole thing. And then you realize that how many national hospitals today, you know, um, are open and working beyond Mulago? And how many private, quote, hospitals are there in Kampala? When you're actually trying to talk about a mixed economy in which the state, in partnership with, ideally, industry, is working the, the line that you have taken. Security is this thing. Every other time, Museveni and Enery have sufficiently managed to blackmail Ugandans. Security, security. Security, my what? You know, 35 years, and you still have to use members to stop young students across Kamoj. Yeah? What did you expect in 1981, when you guys had camps in Seta, Mukonora, and they're actually basically throwing uh, grenades? What do you expect? And you had lost elections, you did not go to court in Barra. Just putting this in context. But number two, beyond that, 
part of the risks that we, the Kampala elite, sometimes get wrapped into it, and I think we do disservice to this country, is to suggest that because Kampala is okay, and supposedly for the last 35 years, even with the whipping of opposition leaders, you know, Gulu was. The first 16 years of NRA, there was literally genocide committed in northern Uganda, and northern eastern Uganda. Huge. So, there was, so for 16 years, Museveni could not stabilize this country. And it took people like us. I was one of those people who went around the world to beg Museveni's colleagues and partners, go and talk to your young man that there should be an, a peaceful alternative because they will not do it uh, militarily. Now, for 16 years, Museveni could not bring national stability because about control of the, the borders of this country. Now, within four years of Luwiro, you know, he had caused the turmoil because the turmoil was in Kampala. So his was four years. He had 16 years and could not bring stability into this country. And then final point uh, about this uh, regional integration, something else. Do you know that NRM has fought or attempted to fight with every neighboring country in this country, in, in, neighboring country within this region except Tanzania? Think about it. I know <laughs> young Matanda, you possibly just at all at the time, including attempts on Kenya. Now, what regional integration, what's peace and security? So it's really b b within the, the, that context. Um, there is no single point out of the 10 which these guys get a tick. Because if you put in context, and if you put particularly the points that Sarah made, for 35 years, um, there is no excuse for you not attempting to do anything. And the fact that they failed and failed so abysmally uh, means that, yes, it was stumbling onto this. That was a show. But of course, yes, uh, uh, swearing in is coming in next week, and uh, I, I just want to listen to, to my colleagues and see hope. Because Matanda, we are with you. We basically want you guys to have a better Uganda than some of us have had to fight around. Thank you very much, uh, Ochen, for, for that expanded uh, context. I, I, I want to, I think, uh, <laughs> Mary, you've uh, listened so broadly, oh, and uh, you ain't there. Now let's try to dig a little deeper into, into the 10 points program. You know, Museven and his team supposedly went to, to the bush to, to restore democracy. Uh, now, it was the first of the, of the Ten Points program. Do you think uh, about this time we see the tenets of a good democracy happening? Okay, first and foremost, um, let me just make a statement about uh, generally the uh, submissions of my colleagues, uh, especially the good doctor from Chambogo University. Your Obi. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, and then uh, senior citizen, Mr. Ocheno. Uh, number one, personally, I feel for anyone to get a proper grasp and put the, 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 um, the happenings in Uganda over the 35 years in context, must appreciate Uganda from, I think, about three or four phases. Number one, of course, the pre-colonial, that one is an understood history. Uh, that the, the doctor mentioned and said, I think, by 1962, Uganda was on uh, a very good path. And uh, uh, of course, yes, the challenges of a particular season definitely present um, the need for other ideas and, and conceptions to, uh, to come up. And um, I think for those who conceived the idea of an independent Uganda, they were on track. Now, here is the issue, that when they conceived and got into power, the seasons of the post-independence also presented challenges that warranted liberation. And that is where the, the, the uh, people like Musei Museveni get uh, um, the justification for now getting into the liberation phase for Uganda. The, 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 an honest question or the genuine question uh, that should be asked was their justification for the liberation struggle? In my opinion, yes. I know on this, that is what my senior uh, comrade Otieno is trying to justify and say, actually, there was no need, because what is happening right now, it's even worse than what had happened before. But then, fast forward, after the liberation, 
are there issues currently that um, warrant another conception of what would stabilize Uganda politically, economically, leadership-wise? I think genuinely, yes. And um, that is what, yes, genuinely, yes. Um, when we evaluate what's happening, there are genuine concerns that the citizens of Uganda have that warrant a rethink. The, the, the only trick and the only strategy that the NRM government has had is that they are listeners. They listen, co-opt certain ideas, and then they disarm those that were waiting, that were depending on those issues. If they had kept a deaf ear on most of the things, right from the um, Kawanga Simogere from 1996, and then the dissenting voices that have come, that have been on the mouse and, and all that, the, the coming into a um, uh, uh, play of Dr. Kiza Besije, the Seyas Seba Galas, I mean, there the, have been a lot of dissenting voices. Now, what is the strategy that has actually sustained? It, it is not so much about repress, uh, the repressive nature of how the leadership is, is, is handling the governance. It's more about adopting some of the ideas, owning them, moving them. I hear many times when people come up and say that was an idea of the DP, that was a UPS idea but Museven jumped on it. To me it is credit to him. If you can hear, learn, uh, actually um, uh, there is a popular saying that when a, a good leader is a learner, is a good learner. When you stop learning, you stop leading. And I think that is how President Museven has kept on top of the game over the years. But first forward, um, getting into uh, the first 10-point um, uh, program, which is about democracy. And um, I think it was made first because maybe it was the most pertinent issue um, of the time that people wanted to address Uganda particularly. Of course, yes, there was a lot during the then government that needed to be addressed. When you speak about ethnicity and, and, and governance being along sectarian lines, was it in existence? Yes. When you go back to dig into the formative stages of the then political parties, what was the drive? And what was honestly the, 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 the dress code of men of them? It, it was a reaction of a segregation of a particular group of people, the formation of the Vakayekas, the UPCs, the DP along Catholic se segregation, and therefore gaining ground now to present and, and, and um, influence things from that point of view. So was there a justification? Yes, there was. So democracy, um, uh, a little bit away from what my colleagues say that for sure, uh, yes, um, they needed to have some uh, scribbled paper and have a few points. And that's what I started with by saying that um, actually even today, that is why we are here and we are discussing them. They democracy. shall continue recurring and recurring. Even American democracy is still in question and is discussed. There is no such a time that society shall ever exist without a question of democracy coming into play. It must be there. Even for the most developed democracies that we admire. When you look at the recent election of Joe Biden and vis-a-vis and -vis his colleague um, Trump, you discover that actually the most pertinent question was about democracy. Up to today, they are still actually contending over that because democracy is a recurring issue in society. Did Museveni and the government, in my opinion, try to address that issue over the years? Yes. 
When you look at the popular governance from the grassroots, the formation of the people's committees, the RRCs that eventually transformed into LCs, the devolution of powers now to the populace, the, um, when you look at the political education that was happening, the appointment of DAs, district administrators that are now called the RDCs, apart from the little diversion of the current RDCs and the structures, um, uh, that then um, their main mission was to do political education in the masses. Because what was the, the, the circumstances and situation conditions um, prevailing then, people had withdrawn. There was a, a, a whole um, withdrawal from the politics and engaging in national uh, governance and issues because of the politics of the time. As I speak, my grandfather was killed actually out of the politics between UPC and DP. He was practically cut into pieces because he was a UPC supporter. I remember that time we, we ran, I don't know how many times, when gangs of people were chanting and they were saying, we are going to so and so's home. We were in the bush. True, a true story. So was there a need to address the governance issue by e involving the population, do political education, make sure that um, people are educated about politics, that um, it is okay to do politics but without uh, going so much on the sectarian side? Yes, it was justified. Then the making of the constitution. Uh, it is only now that in the politics of Uganda that we've watered down the constitution. But sometime years back, the Ugandan constitution was uh, a benchmark for many of the countries. Actually, it was ranked as one of the best constitutions in Africa until when we became too politicized, until when we started using it to play politics of the day, that now it started losing its value. Does it measure up to the, the, the standards of a constitution that any country can have? Yes. Have we addressed most critical tenets of democracy as a country? Yes, we have. By the mere fact that we can have one regular election, one after the other, and the country is still holding forth, I think that is a credit. I refuse, and, and I say it once again, I refuse to be one of, 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 of those that look at Uganda as a curse, as if tomorrow I'm going to become any other person. I mean, the Oceanos are here. They've tried to be citizens of another uh, country, more developed societies, <laughs> and, and they've lived there for years. But what happens at the end of the game, you can base in UK, in America, wherever you are, and paint, black, uh, paint Uganda as a devil, but the fact remains that you can still come back here. And he's here. The senior citizen is here. So uh, let me just say this. So when you, you, you cast um, light into the democratic journey of Uganda, except for the few issues that we are addressing now as a country, it is a challenge. How do we accept in a civil manner dissent without harming each other? That is a pertinent question that we should reflect. And how do we present an alternative view without being aggressors is also a pertinent question that we should be asking. <laughs> okay. Okay. But it doesn't right. negate mm. the progressive and positive journey that the country has moved. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. And uh, right there, Matanda, you've been into the politics, yeah, yeah and, <laughs> and the waters of politics. Do you agree with uh, what uh, Mary is trying to, to expose? Yeah, her conclusion was uh, that her aspiration would be that we find ways of presenting an alternative view without being aggressors. That's How I wish the 1980 the group. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether we would be having this conversation if the 1980 group had taken that path mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, or, or 
of saying we have an alternative view of how this country is being run, and let's propose it without being uh, aggressors. But a number of issues have, have come up, <laughs> and um, I want to make the following comments. Number one, personally, uh, I think that I set a very high standard uh, for, for the NRA, NRM. Uh, because they have styled themselves as revolutionaries. And uh, growing up, my uh, maternal grandfather uh, and my own uh, parents and, and, and the family coming up, I had very good stories growing up in primary about uh, January Kagutam Seveni, about the NRA, about the liberators. And then, of course, as, as I grew and started to, to see things for my own, I also now started doing comparisons and also start, started looking at uh, ways of getting into the history, what, what really uh, uh, happened. So my standard for the 1986 group or 1980 group was very high. Why? Because there is they have styled themselves as revolutionaries. And a revolution, as you know, does not do ordinary things. When a, a, a revolution happens, when revolutionaries are in charge of a country, in quotes, miracles happen. So what I expected out of the 1986 group were actually miracles. <laughs> Moving Uganda from a backward, uh, conservative, uh, hippie, country or society to a prosperous, uh, modern, and you know, progressive society. So the question I ask, if you look at global rankings, whether you want to do them on the economy, whether you want to do them in human capital development, whether you want to do them in stability, where are we? And I can tell you that the facts speak for themselves, because when you're talking about a highly uh, indebted poor country, Uganda uh, will be there. So first, that, that, that's my challenge. So you will not tell me that, you, you, you know, like, like Sarah was saying, I think I, I was struggling to, to find where to credit. <laughs> but the credit becomes very difficult. Why I was struggling is because the standard is very high. You cannot just talk about ordinary things. I'm expecting transformation in two decades or three decades, like what happened in Singapore or what Sarah Kama did in Botswana. To within 20 years move a country from being among the poorest countries to even if you could just say middle income <laughs> 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 country, it was just just a, 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 a very little uh, threshold. So that has not happened. We are still running in circles with a, a, a majority peasant uh, population. On the constitution, I had a conversation with a professor, Professor Minor from Dar es Salaam University, in Feb. And he was telling me, they're actually in pain. He was saying Uganda in the 90s was our model in East Africa. Mm. We are saying, wow, what a constitution. Mm. We are comparing it with our constitution here in Tanzania, looking at what Moy was doing in Kenya, and we are saying, wow, this, this is the right. He said, now. <laughs> we, we cannot refer students to, to the Ugandan model. Actually, now in the region, I think Kenya. Uh, is, 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 is taking the position of being a more Professor progressive Maynard society. Just not understood the question. <laughs> yes. You read it yeah. deeper, you understand it. Yeah, you understand that from the onset. Uh, it, 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 it was meant to fail. So, uh, I think, in terms of the constitution, of course, it, it, it has the issues you're talking By the way, you're saying that the president has a lot of power. While campaigning in Toro sub region in this previous election, he said he has very little power. He complained and said, this. <laughs> How can, the, how can the constitution say parliament shall enact? How about the president? <laughs> he he, he, he says, so they make all the laws? How? So this, this parliament is a problem. And then they, they, they say, okay. yeah, so for you, you're saying the president has a lot of power. The president actually feels he has very little power. Because he says can he cannot I give you information? Now. Yes. Can I give you information? Yes. Uh, and uh, I'm saying this because we're on the Citizens TV, mm. so I'm speaking for the citizens, mm. yes. not as a scholar. If I were yes. a scholar, I have so many things that I cannot say here. Before any election in this country, and you saw the president won by 6 million? 
Yes. We had six million votes. Yeah. The yeah. president goes to an election with two million faithfuls. If you didn't know. Two million faithfuls. Because he's the one who appoints all the judges, all the RDCs, all the ministers, all the cows of all this country. In addition, he has so many smaller, smaller groups of people that he appoints. They are a commander, and for example, if you are an army commander, the power you wield, for those who understand army, you have about 10,000 faithfuls who listen to you when you are David Mohosi. He appoints everybody. He, and it is by constitution. If he has not appointed them, they will not be there. Yes, so, the, yeah, so that speaks to the power of incumbency. Of, of course, it, it should be understood that um, an incumbent would definitely have some benefits. I, 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 in the previous election, you know, the president moved around launching uh, government yeah, yeah. programs and under the pretext of launching. And, and I was wondering, this launch, is this a campaign? Or a, is he there as president of Uganda or presidential candidate uh, of the NRM? So, of course... I agree with you with, with, with the, 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 the issue of the state being fused uh, with the individual. And uh, I, I think that I, I don't blame, for example, our security agencies. I can imagine if you have not known any other commander in chief for 30 years. What, uh, if, 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 I'm, if I'm a soldier in Tanzania or Kenya and I've saluted several presidents and they have gone, I know that leaders come and go. But if you have saluted one person throughout your entire career. <laughs> and, and you're told before you grew up that uh, he created that army, came with it, and magically started it yes, from, yes. from 27. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> yes. So, but to, to go back to my point on the, on the Constitution, and so we, 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 we were models with those uh, problems, not with the standing. But now, even with the one you're calling bad, we cannot... Uh, stand to its aspirations. So you, you, you're seeing increasing us moving uh, backwards. For example, an issue like detaining someone without trial, holding people in communicado, th these are things that we would want to be part of our history, but they are things that are still part of our present. So personally, I'm actually starting to think that maybe the issue is not the constitution or the laws. It's about the, 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 the culture and, 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 and attitudes. Because even where the law is clear, we act uh, contrary to it. Secondly, there is an issue that came up uh, where, where my, my land friend talked about the president copying ideas. And she, she said this is credit. It's, it shows the dynamism, picking ideas from different groups. But I would say I, I, how I wish those ideas could be picked and implemented well. Because I think that many of them are picked, and which is given. a good thing. And credit given. <laughs> <laughs> they are stolen, so <laughs> to, to clarify, you say, the ideas are stolen <laughs> and then poorly implemented. They are not stolen, they are in public. So, for, <laughs> <laughs> so for example, I think some of the ideas that I've had that have been picked is the UP. Uh, project for some people have said it was already in the papers and all that. But if we are to just analyze UPE, I started out in a UPE school. Fortunate for me, I was moved away from there quickly. <laughs> I can tell you in the class where I was, of about uh, 85 people, I think we were only three who were able. Uh, to finish uh, to school escape. and and you know yeah <laughs> to, to, to to escape and survive. In 2014, I, I did a study as national students president about the numbers. You cannot believe when you look at the numbers in this country that join in P1, and then you track them at P7. Uh, so so what we did was to to, to to track at every level this number joined in P1. Where are they at P7? you find 40% have dropped off. Wait for them at senior four, <laughs> and another 20 gone. Senior six, by the time you reach university. But senior four is now 70%. Yes. 
So my, my question always has been, where are these young people? Where have they disappeared to? But even for those of us who proceed to, 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 to escape, like he has said, of course their conversation is around our quality. I, it, it, it's very disturbing for, for people to look back to glorious colonial days of, of good education, yet we all know that the, the, the colonial education was, did not have good intentions. It, it, it was meant to extract. But even with that nature, it's not strange to hear conversations in this country that suggest that the products then were actually better. Finally, I agree uh, with uh, my elder sister that democracy is a continuous struggle. And I think human, uh, human progression is a continuous struggle. And there is no day when we shall reach the summit and say, yeah, now we are there. And every society keeps continuously struggling. The only difference with her maybe is to say, whereas she thinks that that struggle is moving in the right direction, I think that in Uganda, that struggle is in retrogression. Thank you very much, Amatanda. Uh, Sarah. I know you would have issues with, uh, with Dr. saying that uh, yeah. the constitution is, uh, is a tool for dictatorship because you love it so much. <laughs> I want you to weigh in on, on democracy and this tenets <laughs> after <laughs> five years. No, I, I will start with Dr.'s comment saying a, a constitution is a dictatorial tool. Of course, he has some valid reasons. Whereas the 1995 constitution had shortfalls especially when it came to civil and political rights. Serious shortfalls curtailing the political rights and freedoms of Ugandans, yet they had recognized that as a fundamental right, but went ahead and contradicted the same fundamental rights by enacting Article 269. I, I think really that was unforgivable, and, and it was a lack of demonstration of magnanimity of leadership on, on the part of the people that were in the Constituent Assembly. I know the sentiments, I've read the Odoch Commission. I know the sentiments that were expressed by the people. But it's important to note that the Odoch Constitution had two key terms of reference. One, ensure that people's views, wishes, and aspirations are incorporated as to how they want to be governed. And the second key term of reference was ensure there is orderly and peaceful transfer of power. So whereas the Tanzanians, and, and the 1995 constitution in its original form was 80% OK. It had shortfalls on political rights and freedoms, as well as a few other issues concerning land rights that were not clarified. And those were the con most contentious. Because the most contentious issues under the Constituent Assembly were four. It was a question of land, national language, political system and the political freedoms, and then federal. Yeah. So the, the, I, 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 I give it an 80%, you know, OK, tick, really. And that's what the Tanzanians were celebrating, because it celebrated on the other freedoms. The 80% that it managed to deliver was okay, and it was assumed that it would be improved every other 10 years, as, pride, as provided for in the Constitution. The problem then comes on the general regression that the amendments brought in. For example, the key you know, term of reference on order and the peaceful handover of power. So we, we, first of all, the Constituent Assembly let the country down by failing to entrench term limits and age limit as safeguards for orderly and peaceful hand of power. Yet it was clear in their terms of reference. Wait, and it was clear. Let me give you No, 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 let me first finish, Professor, then you give me information. Otherwise, I will forget my thinking <laughs> because I'm speaking off head. Yeah, it, it, because it was clear in the terms of reference and the views collected by Ugandans that the problem of Uganda was political. And there was a need to correct the political by checking the ab arbitrary power, by checking the tenure, and by checking how power is political power is exercised. And, and the detail of the Dutch constitution is, is a very good report, though with a few contradictions on the four areas mainly. 
on the four areas that remained contentious. And it was hoped that they would be improved over time. So when we came in, um, uh, my, my, my sister Mary says, we watered down the constitution through po politics. But who watered it down? You go and park out term limits. You go and park out age limit. You go and suffocate fundamental rights and freedoms. Who, who is doing that? The key function of parliament is to protect the constitution and ensure that you, they are not laws. First of all, they don't contradict the constitution. Because that Kotu is again very clear. Any law or custom that contradicts the constitution is not and void to the level of inconsistency. So you have a parliament that does not even read and understand the constitution and enacts laws that contradict the constitution. And 90% of these laws are executive bills. Mm -hmm. So it means it's the regime watering down the constitution by enacting laws that contradict the very constitution that they take oath to protect and preserve. Second, they go in and break out the safeguards. So it's watering down the, the, the constitution. It is, you know, and, and our constitution had three godfathers. One was uh, Odochi who preside, presided over the consultation process by gathering views. The second godfather was uh, Wapakaburo, who presided over the Constituent Assembly. And the third godfather is the president, who spearheaded the president. So one godfather is, may he rest in peace, he did his bit. The second godfather wanted to extend his tenure as the head of judiciary, <laughs> illegal and constitutionally. And the third godfather, is raping the constitution every day. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so that is the state of constitutionalism in belief. But going back to assessing democracy, you, you have, you know, democracy can only be assessed under four broad areas. The first area is citizenship, law, and rights. So you, you talk about the status of fundamental rights and freedoms in this country. <coughs> We all know where we are. We are under international check on sanctions as regards to torture, forced disappearances, illegal arbitrary <coughs> arrests, extreme cause of bodily and mental harm by the professional security bodies of this country. And we are on check with sanctions. So I think that is an indicator of where we are in as far as rights and freedoms are concerned. We don't need any other explanation as to where we are or, or sugarcoating. When you go to the doctrine of separation of powers, we have the overriding most powerful institution. And there's a time it was recognized that uh, the, the only functional institution in this country is the presidency. So you have everybody, right from border borders, hawkers, to the speaker's race and judiciary running to state house to seek advice on how to conduct their affairs. If there is a problem with border borders, they strike, they want to meet the president. If there is a problem with the taxi, matatus, there is an increment of fuel, like the taxes are proposed. I think after the budget, we might have a, a sit down by, by, by public transporters. Then they go and meet the president. If you have a problem with the casita and the traders, they go to meet the president. The problem with the university students, the military takes over Makere. And Mutesi was one of the remarkable university students. <laughs> she knows the interference by the police and the army. So this is the status of a citizen in Uganda. I don't know whether we need really to explain that we have hit the, uh, the, rock, bottom. The, the rock bottom in terms of that. The second indicator is the representative and accountable government. This is represented by Article 1 of our constitution to say that all power belongs to the people who shall exercise their power by electing their leaders in regular, free, and fair, credible elections. Mary did talk about uh, the regular elections. But the biggest challenge I find with, you know, the elite in this country is 
referring to the constitution in a, a cherry picking manner. If an article says regular free and fair election, well, how, where do we best pick one aspect of that? And then say this is happening, we give a tick. Anybody can organize an exercise and say right now, boy, elections are done. But the constitution demands free and fair elections. We have three court decisions in this country that have held that elections in this country are not free. Uh, neither fully nor fair. The Supreme Court of Uganda, it is not any other court. We have elections we have witnessed. For example, they just concluded elections for which somebody is going to swear in that they've been elected. Professor, I didn't even know the number given it, President Museven, by Electoral Commission, as votes. Because I don't think <laughs> that, 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 that there, there was a method. The numbers we got or the numbers I, I given? don't know, given. Okay. No, 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 right. yes. So, so, okay. right. by, by Electoral Commission. <laughs> because I do not think that that is a fair and verifiable way of people's mandate in this country. Let's just pick a few examples. What have we just experienced as adult, adults in this country? We have presidential candidates that were arrested on nomination day. We have presidential candidates that have been arrested 43 times in the 60 days of a campaign. 43 times in a 60 day campaign. We have journalists beaten, hospitalized, some of them almost died. We have campaigners and supporters run down by the military. They're in court martial now. Yes, uh, but somewhere, uh, some died. Mm -hmm. We have people missing for more than three months. You know, somebody did remark, people were old enough during the mean days. Somebody said, and is a member of parliament in this country, he said that he had never imagined that in this country and in this era, there would be people looking for their persons. You just hear in rumors that maybe your person was arrested. You walk through all known police stations, you don't find a person. You walk through courts, you don't see where your person is produced. You go ahead and seek court mandate through Adias Corpus to have the person released or their body produced if they are dead. And months pass and there is no action, there is no information, you just commit to going to church to ask God that maybe he intervenes and your person appears. This is the status of democracy in this country. We have the, of course, you saw an election, day, including arresting election observers. <laughs> the people, civil society leaders arrested are still appearing on bond, for this bond, charged with observing elections, for which they were credited to do. This is the guy, and then somebody says we have elections. Are we honest as a, as a people? So the, the, the third indicator is civil society and popular participation. Of course, the character of elections explains that. Then democracy beyond our borders. We have immediate neighbors for which we don't talk and the body is closed. And we are known, I think our biggest diplomatic export is military diplomacy. So I, I wish to really leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, sir. I, uh, doctor, you, you had some, some, some information to give uh, uh, Sarah, but in there, you will also come and uh, try to expound on this democracy. Yeah, Damian and colleagues on the panel. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes discussing uh, the history of Uganda is very, is a very difficult thing because it is something that does not give you a lot of pride. Mm -hmm. uh, because every time we don't come on platforms like this to share our achievements and see how we have moved from where we are, mm -hmm to something better than that. We, are, we come to lament. And if you go for me as a student of history, sometimes I just go to this talk show and see what people are discussing. Mm -hmm. For 10 years, for 20 years, for 30 years, 35 and, be, and beyond. And the people are just lamenting about their country and so on. Uh, I, I want to, to first uh, respond to my colleague Mutesi who said that uh, 
we should put these things in perspective, and that's what we want to do. For sure, me, I don't want to discuss a personality. I'm discussing the NRM and its leadership. Unfortunately, its leadership is M7. Mm -hmm. So that's why I will speak about him, because I don't have any problem with the, the person of M7. But I have the problem with the leadership and the, the leadership of our country. First of all, all we have is Uganda, for sure, really. Mm -hmm. There is nothing you can say about uh, Uganda. Uh, I have be, had a chance to go to other places, but the time, every time you land to Entebbe with its potholes, you land there and the plane is bumping in the potholes, but you say it is okay, <laughs> because this is the place you can go now without a pass showing a, pass a passport wherever you go. I lived for some time in Tanzania, but what disheartened me was every time going to renew my residency. And I normally see people staying here. Recently I was talking to a Nigerian and he said he has a life residence. And I said, how did you get it? Mm -hmm. How did you get it? So Uganda is a, a good country and we love it. And that's why we talk about the bad things that are there. So that we get yeah, to a country yeah, where our yeah. children yeah. do not so much lament, but they go to a talk show like this yeah. to share the, what they're achieving in Jinja compared with what they're achieving in, in Gulu, compared with what is being achieved in Kavari. Because sometimes when we're in Kampala here, we tend to think that this is Uganda. No, this is just the capital city of Uganda. There is Uganda out there. So uh, we love this country. We don't hate any leader. Uh, I love my president because he's uh, our president is the only one we have. But we need to remind people, and basing this on history, to understand that we have come from so far. So we don't want people to keep on reminding us. Uh, because I remember my, I went to school up to P7 bare feet. My children, you can't just even imagine that you could tell them that, that they go to school bare feet. <laughs> and they ask me, Daddy, where are your legs not uh, paining you? I say, yeah, they were paining, but uh, I, I, I will, got used. Uh, a bit. I got used. <laughs> so, so, dear fr uh, co listeners and the people watching us, we need to be honest. And honesty is the most important thing when you are discussing your history. You must be honest. Because if you don't, apply honesty. Uh, Uganda, uh, I, I just told you that we are a product of our history. When they were making our constitution, the independence constitution of 1962 in Lancaster, uh, one of the people who was there was the Okot Bitek, who was a student of law there. So he was commenting in the Uganda Agas. Uganda Agas is a, a newspaper that used to be here during the colonial time and some part of the post-colonial period. And he, he was asked by a friend, how is the constitution being made in Lancaster? And he gave it in this way. You know, Kote Bitek was a very interesting man. Mm. He said, the matter of the constitution at Lancaster House is being treated like a sack of eggs. You can imagine somebody carrying eggs in a sack. So you have to be very careful how you carry it, how you put it down, how you move with it, otherwise the eggs are going to break. Because we had gone there as the entities, Buganda, Lango, uh, Acholi, uh, Teso, and each was pushing. And the most serious was uh, Buganda versus uh, his party, <laughs> his party, UPC. Which represented Uganda. Which in interest before yes, elections because even. it had uh, won an election uh, so 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 there was a huge you had to be very careful mm. with how you treated buganda and that's how the matter of the lost countries would not be resolved yeah. in lancaster yeah, yeah. because they wanted to be very tricky with careful with buganda uh, that's how the matter of the presidency would not be resolved at lancaster he said it will be decided on after two years, the other one after four years. So my good friends who are very happy about the constitution, when they are making the constitution, you need to look at the process mm. through which that constitution is made and the powers that are playing. I have been reading through the powers that played at the making of the 1995 constitution. 
I told you there were delegates from all over the place. First was the Odoch Commission. Yes, that one had already done its job. And if that commission was brought somewhere and given to somebody and they drafted a very good constitution out of it, mm -hmm. it would have produced a very good constitution. Because, you see, those recommendations were spurred, mm -hmm. most of them, on the four things that you said. They were spurred. But those were later played around with. And I told you, there was always the what 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 were Pahabulo, honorable, chaired during when people are seeing. And there is what was ba uh, being done at the, the backyard. I talked to Mara Tubanda, I know he will not be he will not be a, he will not get annoyed to if I quoted him because he gave me this in public. Every day Yoweri Museven had to <coughs> meet a group of people and brief them on what they should accept. On what? And one time I was watching a talk show on TV and Romushana confirmed this because Romushana was in that constituent assembly and he was quarreling with my senior mother, Matembe, that you are the people who used to meet every day <laughs> and decide against things which we have already agreed mm -hmm. and it was a serious disagreement and you know when those two disagree, you, you can imagine. <laughs> so. Uh, and how Article 269 was so the, 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 you talked about the safeguards. The Constituent Assembly was that over nobody should ever touch that article which was later changed recently. Nobody should touch that one. Which one? Term the limit. age and the term. Yeah. Nobody. But the Commission, after meeting the President, came and overturned the thing. You are agreeing with the rib. Uh, uh, no, I don't want to So, going okay. uh, after that, that's the information I wanted no, but, to give but, you. But, uh, <laughs> so, Doctor, uh, sorry, let me that. just switch uh, it. Uh, so, <laughs> in other words, whereas the Saras are discrediting the, 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 the most recent um, tampering, a little lifting the skirt, not so much above the knees of the Constitution. Uh, for you, in your paper, in your article, in your writing of so-called uh, constitutional dictatorial mm -hmm. tool, in other words, you're trying to say that there is no need for a Constitution at all? Let me just clarify on that. No, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't say that. Uh, my argument here is that uh, what happens here was intended. It was a well-planned yeah. thing. Because the people, the person who was really uh, the, 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 the midwife of this constitution, he mentioned the three, she mentioned the three, but for me the midwife was the president. He looked at every stage and saw how this affects him. Not Uganda, him. Mm -hmm. So he would see this article, it's okay. This one, mm -mm. Yeah. I don't agree. And yeah. uh, you remember there was a huge disagreement between uh, the president and Sir Wanga Wanga. Sir Wanga Wanga. a propagandist. No. <laughs> no. No. No, no, no. There was a big disagreement between Sir Wanga Wanga Sir Wanga Wanga and uh, and Tunyefunza uh, and Kiza Vesije on the matter of federal and uh, mm. because of that, yeah, go yeah. and follow those uh, three did not endorse the constitution. Because when, once that, because federal was a very popular thing that everybody thought that was just going to pass. Was just going to pass. But it was defeated. Uh, defeated and it collapsed. So to answer you, uh, madam, for me, I wanted really a constitution that looks at Ugandans more than the individual or the individuals. So you see that constitution, there are a number of things. You talk of Article 1. Article 1, power belongs to the people. But uh, power belongs to the people. Anyway. What empowers them to have the power in that constitution? Yes, the power belongs to them. Do they own guns? Do they appoint anybody? They, 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 they are just there. So that's why a court, can, a court decision can be made in court. And uh, after five minutes... Uh, 
some vehicles come and pick those people and take them back where they have been. So who has the power? Jill, why do you want to deceive us that the power belongs to the courts and the people? Because the courts are there on people's, uh, 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 on people, uh, people's power. So uh, uh, listeners, uh, let me leave these political things and go to the, and go to the what I wanted to discuss. <laughs> I wanted, I wanted to, my emphasis was, my emphasis was supposed to be on something that affects the people, a self-sustaining economy. Because for me, this self-sustaining economy thing, you know, we are still on the homeless. I was almost taken up. Joseph, you see, for you, for you've been, you've been there, you've been in the previous government, which was toppled and now you're here. Do you, how do you talk about the, the democracy that you're seeing today? No, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I have never been in any government. Uh, I am very, very delighted that I've never been part of NRA and I'm not interested in being part of NRA until Museveni retires. Um, but I was lucky enough to have been born in the 60s, around the time Museveni, when you're saying he was part of the problem, I'm told as early as 1966, uh, he had issues, he had national grievances uh, from an, an uncollegiate point of view, and he put it on record. So he's part of the national problem. So what he, were the national grievances? Uh, well, I don't know, uh, but uh, he, he said <laughs> so, it's also on record. So uh, 1970, he found himself in President's office, you know. So you don't qualify to be a senior citizen now, uh, oh. if you don't know. <laughs> no, you know, you know, I'm shy at the same time. So, <laughs> no. so, so, um, Mr. Museveni, as suggested, um, was lucky enough, amongst others, to, thanks to Milton Obote that they liked to reform, uh, they found themselves in Tanzania and the rest sort of, as, as refugees, the rest of history. But no, very quickly, I will, um, I will um, refer to the second aspect of uh, uh, this 10-point uh, program, insecurity. Uh, I'll use it basically very briefly to, 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 to make a few responses. Um, Ugandans need to know that, um, as has been suggested, in my home in Agungera, up to 1979 liberation war, and in my opinion, that's the last liberation of this country anyway, official, consensus national liberation war, um, the neighbors of the Jamwas, very well-known family, uh, former member of parliament and my, my, my good cousin, actually, uh, um, Chandi, um, their grandmother nearly fainted when she saw um, a, a Ugandan soldier in uniform and carrying a gun, having liberated Toro, this is 1979 April, uh, returning to his village. The point is that these guys, even during Amin's time, that was the collapse of Amin's time, in Nagongira, it was not a thing to see a soldier in uniform walking, holding a gun. Now, that is Uganda that Mr. Museveni and these guys would want to tell you that before he came in, this country was permanently a war zone, an absolute nonsense. Um, fast forward, I, insecurity. Um, Mary suggested um, um, the experiences of people who've been in and out. I, I was in exile, but Museven was in exile twice. He went to Tanzania, and we still have to know what exactly Museven did when a refugee in Tanzania, and between that time, how he fought his way, and to return to become part of the National Consultative Council, National Consultative Council and a member of that UNLF government twice. Those are records which are yet to come, but uh, I'm, I'm delighted we've got uh, historian and political scientists here. Um, for 18 months, I was in Uganda, I was in Makerere, where these NRA boys found me. Many of them were very little kids, actually. There's another issue of equality or human rights issues, whether or not uh, 12 year kids are uh, entitled, but that's a different story. Context, citizens' chart. It was at my 18th month under NRA, you know, that I was arrested, um, detained, tortured, and faced safe house. I really didn't want to go to the personal thing, but part of what Mary said. But I'm saying so in a very good way. So <clears throat> I escaped a bit, seven roadblocks, 18 months after NRA, seven roadblocks into Entebbe, and thanks to my God, I survived exile. Throughout the time in my exile, I campaigned for nothing else but one, restoration of multi-party democracy in Uganda, and Mary, you'll agree with me, that's a fine campaign. Number two, 
an end to genocide, torture, and terror against our people, a campaign we continue about today. Throughout that time, I've said this and even written it in my several columns, actually more than twice, that continuously I always told you people, particularly those by Zungu, the friends of Museveni who are convenient friends when it's convenient for him, that Uganda is such a fine country that particularly you foreigners, including a Tanzanian or a Kenyan or a Munyarwanda, go to Uganda. Ugandans, once they know that you're not a Ugandan, they will usually not have problems with you. Now, for you, particularly the Bazungu, you know, when you go, thanks to the, your pigment of body, you know, you know, you'll be hailed, even at the peakest, peak of the biggest war. And that was the case, by and large, including during Amin's, war, Amin's time. So I am one of the few Ugandans who've been abroad and campaigned rather constructively for this country. Mr. Museveni, on the other hand, brought the BBCs with the huge campaigns, lining up this skull question of Luero, and as well as 1981, presented Uganda as a terror war zone. But Museveni, by the way, Mary, was a refugee also in Sweden, you know? So I don't know whether Museveni and Janet were busy painting Uganda as a, as a pot of honey. So maybe they delayed our <laughs> progress to economic prosperity in the four and a half years under, 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 UP, under, 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 under UPC administration. So there is something that NRM or NRM-leaning people try to use sometimes to blackmail Ugandans if you're a Ugandan who's been out or you're outside, then you are part of the problem, you're talking down Uganda. And, you know, Museveni and his team are talking down Ugandans by acting down Uganda, which is basically part of our problem, you know. So it's, it's rather rich. And number two, um, Museveni went to the bush after six weeks of elections. And young Masanda has made a very good point. I hope they respond to you why they went to the bush, you know. Um, for me, I was a victim 18 months after they'd been in, which means they had enough time to secure the country. My career university student at the time, they were saying that lecturers at the university were fighting against the government, wanted to fight against the government. And one lecturer said, how do we fight the government? Without chalk or pen? Pens. But that takes me to the second, third point, which is uh, this thing about our supposedly national unity, anti-sectarianism, and things like that, you know. I actually believe that until today, I don't know why I was arrested. I've teased uh, Comrade Rugunda that one of these days, now that I've got three decent lawyers here, uh, maybe I might actually do a, a small bill, you know, and make sure that I send to you and one of the reasons for arrest, torch, detention, torture, and killing my life and my family's life for 17 years of exile, you know. Um, <laughs> I've never stolen a pen, you know, so I, I was abroad substantially against my will, and that's why I refused British citizenship, especially because the British were supporting this regime. I refused British citizenship part because I'm a convictionist Ugandan nationalist, and I refused that because I'm also a refugee scholar. I know what it does in terms of this question about home away from home and things like that. And I'm a total African nationalist. And by the way, because I'm a UPC, I'm completely committed knowing that this country is possible. All we need to do is to critique NRA's 10 point program, dump into the sea because it doesn't apply, Critique NRA's 35 years and see whether or not there's some lessons that we can build together with the national consensus of citizens to ensure that there's a possibility that even in our lifehood, I'm not particularly old, and <laughs> that's why I'm saying it must be very, un very unhappy because I, I still have a longer time, uh, consider them even the oldest here, but to give possibility for our children and the Matandas to have a Uganda which is viable, free, independent, and democratic. The third point which I was saying was if, if it was not for stealing, if it was not for anything else, I suspect I was targeted simply on the sectarian basis of being an Ocheno and O, some boy who did not agree with NRA. It's a difficult thing to say on television. I'm saying it in a very considered way, but by and large, it's a fact. Include that I was UPC. You know, that is actually sectarian, belonging to an op op a political organization against uh, one which is opposed to yourself. That absolutely is contrary to what NRA stood for, allegedly. So these guys need to be assessed within their own context. Thank you very much, uh, Ocheno. Uh, dear citizens and uh, viewers out there, this is uh, the Citizens Chat Show. It becomes exciting as it is, you know. It's a free space and where all views are respected. So we're going to have a very short break and return back. But before then, you need to follow our discussion. It's going on on the Chat Show UG hashtag. Chat show UG hashtag and also follow us on YouTube. We are live there and Facebook live. Thank you very much. Let's have a short break and return. The Citizens Chat Room happens every Friday at 2 p.m. on Civic Space TV online on Facebook and YouTube. We invite you to be part of this conversation. Civic Space TV, 
Freedom always. Uh, welcome, welcome back from this uh, short break. This is uh, the Citizens Chat Show, and the debate gets exciting each day. And uh, thank you for being there with us, and thank you for following the debate. Straight into the discussion that we left from the break, we need to get back and uh, dig deep into uh, this 10 points program and see how far we've scored, how far the, the regime has scored over 35 years. These are the promises they made for us. And uh, follow this debate on uh, online. We are on YouTube for uh, streaming live, Facebook live on there, but also on Twitter, chat show UG, chat show UG is a hashtag that you need to follow. Uh, let me start with uh, 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 Joseph. Uh, since, you, of course, you have a very, you, you feed so much on, on, on both regimes. You've been there. Stop aging. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, it, on security, you know, we, we've... Uh, 59 years of self-rule in Uganda, and uh, the two regimes of uh, Obote and, of course, uh, Amin were faulted for, for not keeping security of, of its people. Now, we are here. Uh, we we promised uh, security, and, uh, but over time we've been seeing uh, these cases of, of, uh, of killings, including um, uh, top officials in government, and People were the young, young women, kidnapped, abducted, uh, killed. And those who have uh, different political uh, views, what do you think? Uh, are we really up to, to, is it promising? From, well, can from you just answer? approve your statement? Because by and large, you're right. <laughs> no, but I was, like I was saying at the beginning, uh, sorry, at the end of the, the, the just before we went to break, um, I mean killed Ugandans, and many. I mean, killed uh, my father's uh, godson. I remember him very vividly. I was a young boy. Um, one of his last trips on his way to Mbarara Barracks, uh, he never, he never, he, he was never seen again. He killed my member of parliament. His remains to date have also never been found. And many other people, and I think a couple of my other relatives. Um, but uh, one time I was uh, talking, it happens to be abroad, uh, when I was in exile, and I was discussing the context of the the security situations in Uganda, but I was also broadening then Uganda, Rwanda, and Congo. And I was very furious um, because uh, I saw and I knew, in figurative terms, the context within which Congolese were suffering, uh, Congolese women and Congolese children, um, as a result directly of Uganda and Rwanda's involvement in Congo. So we need to broaden and contextualize this thing, particularly since the NRM 10 point program allegedly also includes uh, not only the integration of our region, but also the claim Pan-Africanism, which is a slightly different topic. It's rather contradictory. You could not contain those and say you represent those, and then you go and torture uh, and create the mayhem that Uganda has net contributed to the, to the instability within the region. And today I know um, uh, citizens from South Sudan who hold us in not particularly good image. And uh, I worked with a, a Congolese guy who continuously, whenever we met in tea rooms, not so long ago, um, uh, held me clearly in contempt uh, simply because I was a Ugandan. Uh, and this is not so long ago, it's actually as recent as last year. Um, and, and that is how we are within the broader context of security. This is our security. But that said, um, I told that grouping that Amin targeted his victims. Um, in families, Amin picked heads of households and did whatever he did. You know, other people are shot, uh, people disappeared, people were shot and killed at dumped in particular places, um, but not entire households, not entire villages. So if you want to talk about it, as I said at the beginning, uh, and we're saying this with all fairness, and uh, seated next to uh, a history lecturer, we need to be able to tell the truth of what has happened in this country since independence, in this context, what has happened in this country in the last 35 years. And we do so, for me, from a UPC perspective, and that's a Uganda nationalist, to do so from the point of view of ensuring that somebody like Matanda, you know, uh, knows exactly events leading to n the invasion of Rwanda in 1990, the year that, you know, he, 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 he was born. Uh, because Matanda, when he was born in that year, that could be the key history. But I think it was Matanda himself, was it Sarah, who was suggesting that uh, Rwanda is now the Paria neighbor. And then you wonder, why was it worth it? Was it about our security? And then I'm told there are people in Rwanda uh, who will dance and claim they liberated us. Were we liberated by Nyamanya Rwanda saying in, 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 in Luero? Neither here nor there as part of 
you know, because they were part of the Ugandans who, who were there. So our, our, our security situation has been neither here nor there. Point is, as of 1986, whatever else had happened, there was genuine hope that there was a beginning of a new possibility. The lost opportunity with this NRA and the security is this, that Museveni created his NRA to his credit, <laughs> created his NRA in his own image. You know, it was his personal army, it remains his personal army. Easier than what Obotic says, what Obote said, what he found on his return in 1980. He found groups of different militias controlling different kind of parts, and he had to fudge UNLA. That UNLA included NRA. So from a case, very, very easy to be able to do that. So, but because, uh, as uh, uh, somebody was saying during break, that we don't know whether Museveni's interest is this country, uh, uh, his political organization, or indeed himself, is neither here nor there, him being the chief of security. Um, Beyond I mean, you look at what it too, you look at the events of 1966 as most referred to, um, but you go back to events starting from 1964, you know, the battles between Bunyoro and, uh, and, and Buganda and then central government, the attempted lives on Milton about in 1965, going to 1969, and then you possibly put context that well, there were underlying issues leading to some of these other things. Um, you go to the 70s, of course, generally we're fighting Idi Amin, and I told a certain group of people that actually, you could also say, argue, that while I mean the latter part of his year was basically targeting, hitting people, it's true that rebels against Amin existed, um, because, you know, there's an organized group in Tanzania that was coming and undermining Amin's case. Was it justify what it is? Neither here nor there. You bring fast forward to NR NRM, and you see how the war, started in northern Uganda. The not northerners who started the war in northern Uganda. It was about the disappearances of young, actually men of fighting age that started the war down there. The Basilis and Titus were in exile in, in Sudan. Granted, they were preparing to attack, but as of May, March, May 1986, you know, there was no evidence that there was an organized grouping in there. You know, so I think then you look at what happened, I can, I can go on because we don't have much time, look on what happened on going on from how the North and East caught fire. I can't talk about the experience my own family had, including my father, you know, four years into NRA, being forced to skin a chicken using his mouth. I have never said this in public, you know, uh, because sometimes you, you say it and make it personal. This is in Tororo, and you wonder why? <laughs> or you know who some people think is a bishop, you know, kind of stuff, <laughs> you know. So, no, um, the security situation with that NRA has brought, quote, supposed alleged stability would have been possibly fine after 2006, 5, 6, after the settling of the, 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 the guns settling. Had we not looked at Kasese, had we forgotten about uh, whatever else happened in other, all the neighboring countries, but most importantly, had we not in the last six months lost nearly 60 Ugandans, and had it not been the case, I think like Sarah was saying, as of today, the Ugandan citizens whose parents and families don't know where they are. And what I was saying again during the break, fellow citizens, what is it that we can do today? And the chain of UPC is saying, what is it that we can actually do? And to have a genuine national conversation. Everything I raise is not for revenge. Comrade Rugunda, I'm not yet, and unless my laws instruct you know, or advise, I, I will not necessarily send you a big check for trillion shillings for the torture that I went through in my family. Now, I'm simply saying, what is it that we can learn as a lesson? I think uh, Mary Mutesi made a, another point, you know, that um, the things that we can do to make sure that uh, we learn from our past and make sure that these things don't necessarily happen. Security in this country is possible. Um, I gave you the example of the Jamwas in Nagongira. Um, except the political um, like mini madness of Mr. Museveni keeping himself and his political organization power. There is no reason why, whether it's the constitution, the state in which it is, uh, our question of our diversity, uh, uh, I keep on saying, I think I stole this program, the first time I was outside Tororo and I was helped by a stranger was in Ankole. You know, this guy kept me in his home and gave me 20 Uganda shillings to proceed to where I was going to, to, to Kabul. You know, this country, that was before the Museveni escape. This country is possible. Milton Obote was elected a president of Uganda People's Congress, you know, in absentia. Not by Balango, not by Jobs, across the Ugandan country, state. That is 
the context of diversity that number seven talks about intolerance, past intolerance, things like that. No, and finally, of course, Uganda People's Congress, as you know, is the nationalist political party that was founded on the drive for uh, the self-determination, uh, our the, the interest of the ordinary African versus the Bazunga and the Asians exploiting our country, basic rights for our citizens and things like that. So that's still, while we retain that, there's no reason why these values, and these values are not sacrosanct to Uganda People's Congress. What I told me, Joe, you know, Hospitals don't know tribe, they don't know religion, they don't know political parties. It is possible. If, even if this is sort of my last contribution to this, you know, is it possible as fellow citizens that we go through sessions and one professor here has uh, uh, gra gladly agreed that I will possibly give a session to one of his class sessions one of these days. Let's talk our history, let's talk the facts, let's the profession, let's the academias critique and bring out the evidence. But beyond that, let's find a possibility of healing. That is possible. I think we need leadership. Mr. Museveni, as he presents, if only to his last term, next week, let him actually pick on this opportunity. He controls the army and then controls the security, begin to act like a parent and make it possible for us to live together in diversity, because that is possible in this country. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ochin. Uh, uh, Ojambo, you, like he says, uh, security is possible in Uganda. 35 years, are we, have you seen much of it? Yeah, he has already given a mouthful, and therefore I'll just give a short comment. You know, uh, uh, to simplify it for anybody listening out there, security should not be discussed as an amorphous thing. We should do, divide it into smaller parts so that we can understand. There is security of the state, mm -hmm. security of uh, the individuals and their property, mm -hmm. and then security of mind. So those, those are the three I can look at very well. Uh, when it comes, we did you respect, really. And uh, let's give uh, credit where it is due. There was a time when Uganda was really a very disorganized society. Nobody wanted to speak about it. If you could uh, compare it, it had become the sick man of East Africa. Uh, for some time, at least right now, there is what we call state security. So if you are within the parameters of the state, you have security. And that's why you see, for example, uh, the presidency and those other institutions around them, really they are very secure. And, uh, and, uh, and when you look at uh, the country, <laughs> when you look at the country, at least now Uganda is not a country you can just joke with. Uh, there is that respect that we have because we have built an infrastructure. Uh, somebody one time did a, a study and found that uh, NRA was the most fit army in Africa, followed by LRA, both Ugandan. <laughs> because these armies, because these, because these, chaps, these armies have not only <laughs> fought within Uganda, but they have fought kilometers out of Uganda. You can imagine an army man moving from Magamaga or wherever to Central African Republic on foot, chasing NRA, which, LRA, which is also running on foot. There is no any other army that has done that in Africa. And therefore there we have built capacity to an extent that, uh, to an extent that we have even... Uh, it is, one, it is one of our biggest exports, mm. AME. We have exported it to African Union. We have exported it to Somalia. We have exported it all over. And our boys are doing a good job there. It makes me happy, really, when I see the commander of the African Union AME, and he's a Ugandan. I say, that's good. Mm. So in that aspect, we have moved. And let me tell you, with the power, that one you cannot discredit. We can't be a country and be a country with a weak army, which anybody can joke around with. So there, tick. When it comes to security of individuals, that's where there is a problem. And that security is normally supposed to be done by the police force. I've been really requesting them, they change that name to police services than a force. This force, unlike its mandate to keep the Ugandans and their property, they have decided to keep the leaders and their power. So in that case of individual, my, uh, my fellow, uh, my person in my village in Maweito, uh, village in Jinja, or in other place, 
that security is really shaky uh, because the police is not there to protect the people and their property. In fact, if you go to these villages, people have created their own security. At night, they protect their cows as a village. Because police, you go there, they ask you so many questions uh, and that uh, problem. Of course, people will urge you. But you want to say, so how come there, is a, there, there are no a lot of problems? But there are problems only that people know how to resolve their problems. Then the, the worst is the security of the, of the mind. Uh, in this country, we are slowly degenerating into a country where even now people fear to speak about things that affect them. Every time you are speaking, people are asking you questions. But you, man, we, where have you gotten the confidence to speak about those things? And I thought, uh, once we lose that security, then the people go into other things that we don't understand, and we shall create a lot of uh, insecurity. So people are very insecure. When you hear the opposition, me, I'm, uh, I'm a political, but when you hear the opposition speaking on TV and radio and the civil society, you just see insecure minds. They are very insecure. They are not happy with things happening. So we need to put these together. And we say, then, has NRA scored in this area? Yes. For keeping the state and the sovereignty of Uganda, yes. But for keeping the people and their property, I doubt. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, 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 <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Jamo. <laughs> Sorry, would you want to weigh in there, or you have your independent opinion? No, no, no. I will just maybe, you know, as the doctor was saying, mm. people are scared to speak. Because freedom of conscience, freedom of thought, freedom of expression are combined freedoms. And if people are scared to speak, it also means that they are scared to dream. And once you have a nation that cannot dream, then it can't create and recreate and it cannot innovate. And the victory we have in yes, and, uh, yes, so and, and we are in the knowledge economy, really. <laughs> so we have a nation that is scared to speak, to dream, to think. Because once you have freedom of thought and freedom of conscience, then you cannot suppress expression. But once you suppress expression, you suppress thought mm. and conscience, mm. and the nation cannot dream. So that's why even we are in declining economies, and then you, th you, see you have a leadership which thinks in terms of hardware, thinking mm -hmm. that they will increase the tax base through creating new taxes when, there is no, when the domestic uh, <laughs> revenue is shrinking. But away from that, you know, the, 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 the strategies for, for national security include using d diplomacy because you must create allies and international, regional, you know, neighborhood, uh, and beyond. And our diplomacy is largely a huge domestic diplomacy. We export armies, or call them mercenaries if you want. We can fight any war. And for the time we are engaged in several wars, you know, there were less human rights abuses. By the, by the army, nationally. Mm -hmm. And maybe you could think that they are now a bit idle. And, and because they are trained to fight whatever, you know, they, they, they had power fighting, and maybe they are now turning. Because if you look at the abuses we had in, in the last election, freedom of conscience is, is criminalized. Uh, political dissent is criminal. If you don't support the president, then you are a terrorist. You know, that, that, that is the kind of trend we are going into. The second aspect of, you know, the second strategy for national security is marshalling economic power to facilitate or compare cooperation. During the times, and with the strength of, of the cooperative movement, each region had comparative advantage on both cash crops and food crops. You knew you could get sugar cane and cassava from Busoga and Ginats. We knew you could go to Kasese, get copper, get fruits and, and other things. Yes, and cotton. Then we knew in the north you could have so many fruits. And, and, and we now have the sort of fruit factory. 
among other things. Then in the West, you would look at milk. And by then, you know, the <laughs> matoke used to be a Uganda crop. Mm. You know, there's a joke that to know that blessings shifted. Even matoke shifted to the West. <laughs> but <laughs> <Back> to you. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how, I don't know how that happened, but <laughs> but now the West produces Mamatoki. That, that and then the second region producing Mamatoki is in Bari. Mm. Yes, you know, but these changes would be normal if we yeah, had yeah, yeah. cooperation, and, and that helps in, in reducing the fragmentation of yeah, society. Yeah, yeah. But this is no longer existing, so we do not have any deliberate economic production to compare cooperation and harmony of citizens. And that is an aspect of insecurity. The, the third aspect is maintaining effective armed forces. I think we do. We have, you know, if you ranked our security in terms of, of competence and, and trainings, including formal and specialized military training, it would rank very highly. But the most ab absurd, absurd thing that it does, if you compare the, there are so many generals in the army from brigade above with the master's education, postgraduate education, including specialized the military trainings. But when you come and find that the same highly trained, highly brilliant people are the number one human rights abusers. Mm -hmm. Then you fail to correlate the use and value addition of this um, massive training to the quality of a citizen in this country. You would expect the best in terms of formal and, and professional education to offer citizens the best service. But the reverse is happening. I, and really, I find that mismatch disturbing, quite disturbing. Then the, the, the second last aspect is implementing civil defense, the civil military relations, police. Yesterday I was having a joke with a group of people that I traveled with in a van that is normally called the drone. So we reached somewhere and hooted, and the person they peeped and closed the door, peeped twice and closed the door. Then on the third time I said, ah, we are in a drone. So I said, we, uh, someone needs to get out and explain. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that is the nature. You have a drone, you have somebody dressed in military fatigues, citizens are going to take off. Mm. Yet, in the early days of President Museveni, we had the most loved army. People, you know, the pro people army. Everybody admired soldiers. Everybody wanted to associate with them. But these days, when you see them move twice on your gate, you start checking, is there a problem? <laughs> you know, and, and that is not a good sign. Then the, the, the last aspect on the strategies is emergency preparedness measures to secure the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the people. I want to discuss sovereignty beyond in, in nation borders because sovereignty is both the people as well as the geographical location of the people. If you put a geographical location without people, it does not qualify to be called the sovereign. So when you look at preparedness to secure the people, we can look at situations of disaster because I think this country, other than the talk of ADF, ADF was the last, I think, kind of... Official. Yeah, civil kind of, you know group trying to wage armed rebellion. Of course, I with LRA. The rest, there has been talks, talks, scattered talks, but I don't think beyond LRA and the ADF we have had any other rebel group as a country. If there is any then me, we don't have evidence of its activities. So, other than ADF and LRA, we have disasters, which also require emergency preparedness. But when you look at the recent example of locusts and COVID, I remember the clip of, of the minister saying they are looking for locusts everywhere, as, <laughs> as if they were desperate, they are looking for disaster. <laughs> we are looking for locusts, we can't track them, and they had spent all the money. So they were stuck. 
you have a budget for, for, for an emergency, you have spent the money before the emergency happens, so now you are running like headless chicken looking for this emergency because it has not manifested <laughs> itself. <laughs> You need to the figures, and it comes. <laughs> 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 then look at COVID. We are ranked among the 10 countries that uh, have ma managed COVID. But when you look at the Auditor General's report on the mismanagement of COVID funds, you, you can only cry for your country. People supplying fake oxygen. People are doing all sorts of things. The, the ICU beds promised per regional hospital, some of them don't exist. So maybe God, we can say God did a big job in saving Ugandans. And even uh, in the midst of threats of the second wave, we can as well say God should uh, strengthen the protection. And because if they... You, if you don't mind, just to say one thing, Sarah. <laughs> yes. No, I think this was my emphasis. This country... <laughs> It's not really possible. Ugandans are amongst the most industrious citizens in, this, in, the, in the world. So it's really much more about credit to the industry and innovation of our people uh, that actually managed to mitigate many of these things. Don't forget that even some of the medical professionals who try, they go to the extremes considering the kind of uh, facilities that they've got. So to our credit, it's really, really genuine hope that actually if we're properly organized, properly led, and there is the spaces which is open for us. There's no, we, we could really, really go very far. But yeah, yeah. Thank you, Joseph. But uh, to conclude, I, 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 I will crown my argument to say that the elements of national security correlate closely with the concept of elements of national power, mm -hmm. and the two must be looked into together. And the, at the center of this is the welfare of citizens. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Then, Matanda, you're the national coordinator of uh, the, <laughs> the arts youth. <laughs> and you're, you're, you're traversing the country around the elections. And uh, about the elections, do you feel that the young people out there are, are okay with the security that is in the security, around the future? Yes. Yeah, so, first of all, I will, um, I think, I agree with the structuring of uh, uh, the doctor, Jambo in trying to categorize security into uh, different facets. And I agree with him in as far as he says, uh, I think there is state, of secu uh, state security or security of state. And that's where it stops uh, for me uh, as far as I'm concerned. Growing up still, I, I said earlier that I had a lot of credit to the NRA and M7. And one of the words I found repeated so much by the NRA was the word state-inspired violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that word, it's not very common now, but it appears it was a crusading statement for, for the NRA, abusing, uh, and, and I've watched a couple of very many interviews by President Museveni, presenting that as the, the, the most pressing issue that took them to the bush, state-inspired security. Violence. Yes, I mean state-inspired violence. So, my, my assessment, when, when I look at that, and then the, the history that Sarah has shared of a time when the army was loved, when a person driving a taxi or a bus, if, if they saw a soldier who wants to move, they, they would yeah, quickly want to, to create space for them. I don't think that's the situation now. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the, it's, it's, it's not the, the, the general feeling. So I think part of what you know, countries or societies have questions. So in Uganda, we have several questions. We have the Uganda question. We have, I think, the seven questions, as you said, has been a problem <laughs> since the 1966. I think we also have the question of the militarization of our politics. That it, it's hard to tell the difference between our politics and our military or security. I asked a uh, police commissioner uh, having the youth election is in Bali, and we were at Bali, uh, SS, the, 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 uh, the, the, the grounds of Mbali SS, but there were so many soldiers and very few police people. So I asked mm -hmm. the police commissioner, who seemed to be commanding the operation, so I asked him, <laughs> what's the problem? Why? We are youth leaders mm -hmm. at a district level. We are not carrying stones or pans or what. Why is there a very heavy presence of the military? not even police, 
Then he said, of course, you know, our money power is, 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 is very small, so we get support. But I said, they seem to have outnumbered you. So are you supporting them or are they supporting you? So on our, uh, on our streets, in our everyday civic engagements, increasingly we are seeing a greater presence of the army. And everyone knows that the army from the training they receive and their mandate, the way they respond to situations is mm -hmm. different. Yeah. Uh, about two, two weeks ago, I had the honor, we, uh, we, we are representing a lady whose son was shot during the, the 19th November uh, riots. riots and was shot by military police. And possibly it's because for them they are trained to shoot a doi. Mm. So when you bring them to the street, mm. th they are seeing mm. the citizens mm. as a doi, putting mm. them out of action. Yeah. That training is different from the training that the police receives or is supposed uh, uh, to receive. So, and we also had many senior army officers before the election declaring that they cannot salute certain presidential candidates. Mm. I don't know why, why were those statements necessary? Is it in the place of, of our uh, military officers to say who they will salute and who they will not salute? If, if the citizens have chosen their president, then who, which, who are these voices? I try to do research and uh, to follow events in the whole of East Africa. I can tell you, it could be a form of ignorance but for me, it also tells me something. I don't know any general from Kenya. Mm. I cannot name any one general yeah, from Kenya. Yeah. <laughs> it's possibly because they are not on the TVs and on, on the streets trying to manage the politics, leave the politics to the politicians. There will be issues of strategic security and securing the integrity, the mm. territorial integrity uh, of the country. Let but me share some little information yes. on Kenya. You know, during the 2007 election violence in Kenya, the army first stayed in the barracks for one month, leaving police to manage the violence. And before they came out, they announced that we are now <coughs> coming out because it has gone yeah, beyond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people saw Kenyan army for the first time on the street mm -hmm. engaging mm -hmm. with the people. Yes, yeah. so, so from that example, you can tell that there are even levels of engagement. So it seems we are, we are engaging the highest gear on civilians. So that means, what if the situation escalates? So who, who, who will come in? So, so, so that's on that front. But also, of course all of us at some level keep giving credit uh, to, to the state in Uganda and the government for security. But the other concern for me has always been, I think you would have greater security if the security is institutionalized. Because I've seen people who argue that, you know, we need to keep the president to guarantee our security. And I'm saying, if it's tied to one individual, then is that security? Because a, a, a country can be said to have won uh, the war on security by how successfully they're able to manage things like a transition, which are very delicate and usually problematic, just like how we have seen things play out in Tanzania with the death of the president. So I think that so long as we have not been able to have an orderly uh, and, and, and a peaceful transition of power, there's still a big question mark on the allegiance of our security. Whose security is this? Is it for the people of Uganda? Is it for a given individual? Finally, personally, I believe, and I think you know, that you cannot have security without just and without prosperity. Right now I come from uh, a district called Bududa. People are now, people have stopped, uh, are stopping to keep, I was having a conversation with my grandfather and said they can no longer keep goats and cows and you can no longer, you're saying Mbale produces a lot of matoke, mm. that may change in the next two, three years. Why? Because now that is a security threat. If you have a cow, you have a goat in your house, you have a, 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 a banana plantation, the neighbors are going hungry and they are not, their children are not going to die when there is a farm here. So now owning property is becoming a security threat. So to be safe, you must have nothing. Let's, let's, let's all have nothing, which of course undermines uh, economic, uh, someone talked about the, the, uh, I think it was Sarah who talked about mm. how security is linked 
Yes, to the economy, the status of the people. Now, on the economic front, we have so many desperate young people who have nothing to eat and who, se who seem to be hopeless, and so they have become security. I can now not pick a call on the Kampala streets, mm. you know? Even mm. outside. Even here. outside here. And, and people, and, and our walls and, and fences are growing longer and becoming sharper because everyone is scared of everyone. So there is that level of insecurity that has grown because of the failure to manage the economy. And then what we have already said in conclusion is now that initially, uh, in fact, this was written to me by a friend. He said when the riot started, in his mind, he said, when I could see police or the army, I would feel secure. And then he says, I think after like three days, he saw people who were shot. There is a lecturer of UMI who was shot on the street. The, this, this friend of mine was uh, in, in that area. Then he said, oh, now when I see police and the army, I have to run. Because they are actually now the ones shooting indiscriminately. Because this lecturer was not burning any tire was not uh, doing anything. Like so we have, it seems like we are, we are degenerating our, the confidence in our security and the professionalism that we have already sung a song about is deteriorating and, and, and moving southwards. We are now seeing a lot of impunity uh, on this. It's now uh, very common on the streets of Kampala to see people holding guns. They are not in uniform. They don't identify themselves. To also see those in uniform hiding their faces Rather than move to a place where they are having their tags and, and being identified, now again we are moving towards uh, hiding our faces in hoods and, and working in tinted cars and, and, and operating in, 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 in a mafia, mafioso uh, kind of situation, which, which, which really is unfortunate. So, in the final analysis, I think that we need to check those two areas. Number one, work on justice and prosperity of the people. That's the best way to guarantee security. Uh, but number two, this song about professionalization seems to be, uh, you know, working in the rivers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Almatanda. Mm. Uh, uh, professional army, 35 years. I know we can have three that uh, we've enjoyed uh, the security. <laughs> Let me um, make two uh, statements first the negatives, number one. The only mistake that we've made as a country, it could have been um, justified for a particular period of time. But the only mistake we've made as a country is to over-civilize the army, in my opinion. Uh, yes, it was very necessary at the time of the making of the 10 points program to demystify the uniform, to demystify the gun. But I think we wanted, to, we needed to give it a time period uh, when actually slowly and in stages we, we would withdraw the army from the public. Why do I say that? That I think over the years, in the 35 years, government has built a professional army, which is good, but too civilized that even the civilians no longer respect it. And I think what uh, the honorable colleagues are trying to actually um, uh, speak about as saying uh, th th they are too present, they are too politicized. We've come to a level where an ordinary civilian does not respect that uniform. That's why you find even people putting on combat being dragged into money holes because we've created that familiarity. Actually, to me, I think that program of, of making that uniform, making that national emblem, making the gun be a fear factor in the population, it must be built. Actually, away from what my colleagues have said. For them, they believe actually there should be no fear. My, my, my greatest 
problem is that even us, the civilians, cannot actually fear. I, I, I defer with Musei, with the President Museveni, the army should be feared, that uniform should be respected, the gun should be feared, and, 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 and to me, uh, I always tell my friends, they say, hey, this one is your friend. I said, my dear, this thing here can never be my friend. You put away your thing. I don't want to see it. Because the moment it faces me, either by error or by omission, uh, it, it definitely puts out my, my dear life. So you cannot tell me that it should be my friend. How? How should I make a gun my friend? For what? I mean, are there no better things to make friendship with than you telling me I should make friends with a gun? So I think it is high time as a nation we began on a program where we instill respect for the national army, resp uh, instill fear in that gun, uh, other than um, uh, what my colleagues are saying, I think it is high time. Any other leadership that will come in after Mze, we are going to have problems. Problems in a way that the, the, the population is accustomed, is used, has, is familiar. There is nothing new. They can drag you around whether you're what or what. So it is a very big problem for the development of society. Point number two, that is a negative for us in our handling of the national security, is the materialization. Materialization of our lifestyles has consumed us even deeply into the security forces. I was speaking and conversing with one general, a friend of mine, and, and, and I, I just told him point blank. I told him, but sir, if, if you're, you're traveling with a driver, with a bodyguard, and he comes in such a mansion and in such a castle and sees for you what you're having for a home, uh -huh. how your children are traveling to school, uh -huh. how your wife is traveling to work, is the one who drives you to your business empires, why would you expect that young man not to feel that also he should one day use that uniform to uh, amass wealth because you're the icon, you're the mentor. He's looking up to you. The reason why he's putting on that uniform is because he feels that uniform should lead him into something. And what he's seeing, it is what he's going to live up to. He knows. If you tell your story that you came from a sergeant to a certain level, to another level, until you made it to a captain, and now to a major, and now to this, his impression is that that uniform has allowed you to, 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 to have what. So that is the mindset they are having. Okay. So have materialization of, have a quick question for Mary. of the whole society. Yes, yes. Sir. No, no, it's on, the, on your point number one on fear, mm -hmm. the basis of fear. Mm -hmm. And I want to compare to two different armies. One is the Kenyan army, which we've talked about, yes. which stays in its barracks, and once it comes out, it's clearly feared and respected. Mm -hmm. The other approach that I thought uh, President Museven had intended to instill in the army here is the Chuban approach of an army that serves the people, mm. that builds hospitals, which where was, army doctors treat which people. Is a good which is good Yeah, so which one should we go for? Because no. the one that should be feared mm -hmm. must be professional and remain in the barracks. But we have ours, which is even in politics, including the no, parliament. Um, I think the factors of the time were ranting the army to get into the political line. In what way? It was very... Uh, 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 crucial for Uganda for actually army to understand the politics. And for me, the justification for them even being present in parliament is well understood. Because it was a two-way political education to the masses and also political education to the army. Understand the ideology, understand the vision of a country, find your place for contributing to the national uh, uh, well-being of the country, and also take care of your docket. To me, that was smart.
But when it comes to over-presence, which Sarah is talking about and saying we've drawn into the barracks, uh, barracks and all these, and then on the other side we have an army that is pro people, it is treating people, it is educating people, it is involved in agriculture. That is actually what an army should be doing. It must, when you look at their mandate, as the UPDF, you discover that actually it's broader than even national security. After all, even security is not limited only to um, defense of national guns. borders and guns. It's all, it goes up to food security. So if if an army, yeah, yeah. Sarah, Sarah, let me drive my point home, my dear. So if, if, if the army is not addressing these other tenets, of national security, then definitely they would not be driving home and achieving on their mandate, which is very okay. The other point, away from the negatives that I personally feel, away from that, to understand the contribution of President Museven and government in that 35 years. Uh, Mr. Ocheno, um, I hope I'm pronouncing, there is Otieno, there is Otieno, there is Ocheno, so <laughs> there is Ojambo, Odiambo, so uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Now, when, when, when you uh, look at the 35 years, you need to understand Uganda. How was Teso before or even within the 35 years? When you ask a person from northern Uganda, mm. has the NRM government, I'm not a government spokesperson, has it delivered <laughs> on this? They will say largely the yes. Disclaimer. They will say largely yes. Because they and look the at their <laughs> life in the 16 years that Mr. Uh, that Joseph spoke about, the 16 years of his surges, how was life? Right now you see northern Uganda, imagine, yes, years, yes. imagine, 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 out of a very delicate situation, go to Karamoja, go to Karamoja, go to Karamoja, ask the Karamojongs, mm -hmm. are you seeing a, a green light? at the end of the tunnel within these 35 years a person from Karamoja will tell you yes. Ask Teso. They will tell you, you know Teso. No, 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 no. no. They are not. Yes, we are speaking. Yes, yes, yes. Daniel, let me drive my point home. Ask a person in Teso and say, do you see some security in these years. They will tell you from what we used to have from our brothers, the Karamajongs, mm -hmm. it is yes. Has the government put out in insurgencies? Yes. Look at La Puena, look at ADF, you look at UNLF in you know, West Nile, look at all those ones. Uh, LRA, you'll discover that actually there are some milestones that we've reached as a country. Then the other thing, ask about human security. Ask as about, conclude, yes, as, as I conclude. Yes. Human security, also, you need to, 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 to um, uh, uh, divide Uganda. When you come to urban centers, yes, crime is prevalent. And the other thing that we, we, we speak about uh, uh, crime, Many people say it is because of the development of society and therefore the population and Matanda spoke about that. The challenges of the demographics of the youth, unemployment, and therefore the crime rate, we can link it to many things. But when, uh, when you're, you're to do a holistic analysis in terms of security, as a student of international relations, um, Sarah mentioned about it, the national elements of, of, of uh, you know, of power. We, they call it dime. Look at diplomacy, look at information, look at military, look at economics. How are you doing as a country? Whatever uh, people call as military export, I think in a region like the Great Lakes region, 
and the positioning of Uganda in the heart of the Great Lakes region, it is justified that Uganda could go to Congo, Uganda could get involved in, in Southern Sudan, Uganda could pick interest in what was happening in Central African Republic, that Uganda is present in Somalia. If we run away from that as a country, security-wise, defense-wise, we would be in very, allow me to use the American language, we would be in too hot shit yeah. as a country. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mary. You know, the, the, the debate on security is uh, an extensive one that mm -hmm. we would have over and over. We've had oh, it yes. on this uh, platform, and possibly in future we, we shall have it. But uh, finally, in uh, three minutes, I would I want us to conclude the, the, this conversation because uh, we are short of time already. But uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the program, the 10 points program, there, there are two issues that I would want us to match. The building, because it says building an independent, integrated, and self-sustaining national economy. That was one of it. But also, there was the issue of uh, eliminating corruption and misuse of power. I would want us to match this. Yeah? And uh, I don't know who goes first. I, would, I want to give you uh, an opportunity. Yes. Yeah, let me go first. And three minutes. And then yeah, we have very little time. time. Uh, I think he, even that one, we shall put it in perspective. In 1985 and the, the time before that, we had a lot of issues with our economy because of the problems that we had from 1966 to that time. Uh, so the, the, the first thing was, uh, how do you deal with the consumables things? I just want to simplify it. Things that people eat and use it to survive in life. Uh, in that area, I think he uh, supported by a number of factors, uh, the structure adjustment programs, which I have problems with, and so many other things. We managed to, to, to solve that problem. At least now, if you have money, you can get what to buy in the shops, uh, in terms of soap, these small, small things. But when it comes to macroeconomics, what builds the economy uh, where we hinge our life, in that area, we have not done very well because we took on privatization, we took on uh, these other things. And uh, by 1994, Uganda had almost lost all its parastatals. They have gone. Uh, right now, if you hear the debate with the Umeme, it is suddenly that you have a company which technocrats signed with the with the, so, uh, some company from another place. I don't want to talk about countries here. And that thing is just absurd. You have a contract where they are not supposed to make losses. They can go any time. They determine the prices. And that's why you have an electricity crisis. And once you have a problem with electricity, then you are in trouble. The other problem has been the collapse of the railway system in, U in, in Uganda. Uh, uh, we have been uh, talking about construction of roads. I think there is no road that has been constructed in Uganda and it doesn't have a pothole. Even the newest, the Entebbe Express, already has potholes. There is a scandalous road which starts from Bueogerere to, to the, the, the Northern Bypass. That road is scandalous. That road was started in 1997, when I was going to the university. <laughs> it's a scandal. <laughs> and it has had I don't know how many contracts and unfortunately, the, much of the money is a loan to Uganda by European Union, and uh, we are now paying. And therefore, that is the macroeconomics now that affects us. People have been talking about roads, but how are these roads helping to grow the macroeconomics? For example, if all roads are being built by loan or loan money, then you have a very big problem. And yet, where they are going, they are not targeting production. There is a very big problem. And because of that, we now have a debt burden where every Ugandan living and dead must pay 1.5 million shillings. <laughs> <laughs> All the Ugandans who have been there, if you divide our debt, we must pay 1.5 million shillings. Oh, I think, in, but, and, but and now for you who are Muslims, I think when somebody dies, Mm. They have to first contribute money and yes, pay. Yes, because when you talked about uh, death, yes. for us before you were buried, yes. you must there, there pay. is a pronouncement. That you that must pay. The so so, the so that is one, one of the other problems. <laughs> now you talk about the second thing, which is corruption. Because of time, I'll just rush through. 
Uh, in fact, corruption has become an, a form of investment in Uganda. The more corrupt you are, the more resources you have. So it is a form of investment. And I think it is, you know, the president promised us that he wanted to promote a private-led economy. And people doubted him that he would do that. But that private-led economy was going to be promoted by taking away resources from the country to the private people. <laughs> and it has succeeded. Now, macroeconomics, that one just fails the country. The people cannot be richer than their country. Now, the, hmm. the, the country is now borrowing from individuals. Can you imagine? These days you go, parliamentarians are discussing they want to borrow from an individual in Uganda. Macroeconomics does not allow that. So uh, in that area, we have failed. Now, what is called in Uganda here, corruption is theft. It's real theft. And, oh, these, and these lawyers need to help us not to, to sit talk these things. When they are presented to that anti-corruption court, my view is that they should be charged of theft because it's no longer because everybody knows that you you have deprived because theft by definition is depriving somebody of the, he, owner. the owner of uh, something uh. that's what they do here uh, many people have deprived citizens a road they have deprived them a school they have deprived hospital. them a hospital and they are known they are known people, the president knows them, even talks about them, says, forgive this one, we have talked to him, this one, leave him. And even the people themselves, we don't want to, 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 to accuse the president here. A corrupt person now is a very popular person in society. <laughs> and that has also been built by this a private-led economy. <laughs> because he, people say he has taken from the state and he has brought it nearer to us. <laughs> but not knowing that it's going to affect us. Uh, look at Parliament of Uganda. It's one of the most corrupt institutions that we have. Yesterday I learned, if we have been observing, in the Parliament these days they sit in the tents. There are two tents there. Yesterday I was shocked that those two tents each goes at 14 million shillings per day. To buy or... to, to rent it, to put it there. <laughs> and you know Parliament sits on uh, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, Friday and Monday they don't sit unless there is a problem. But that person, the owner of that mm, tent, mm. charges seven days every day, including mm. public holidays, because it is erected there. I calculated mm. that money, it is 10.2 billion in a year. You know that Parliament now is going to rent this house, this house called Kingdom how kingdom something which is now where there was shimoni shimoni hey, shimoni they are, they are going to rent it from the next financial year at a rate of 13 billion shillings per year where the uh, hotel was built now, at our national now school i am asking why doesn't parliament build the offices using that same money that same money 13 billion shillings mm. and therefore i don't want to go into details mm. Corruption is institutionalized. It is now, uh, it, is, it is okay, and therefore we have a very big... That is one of the biggest success of the NRA, to promote corruption. You have used more than three minutes. I was about to accuse you of corruption also. But uh, I hope the rest will... You know, the doctor was talking about uh, how the people sort of celebrate you know, thieves yeah. in, in society. I remember the Mandela's quote on how poverty dehumanizes people. During elections, I think it's the highest uh, people participatory system mm -hmm. where the manifestation of corruption can easily be defined on how people sell their votes or their sovereign power as to should govern them in the next Five years, people sell their votes as cheap as 500 shillings. But the justification that, that, that local people use is that, after all, government does nothing for them. So let them get their part of the bargain as you go so to make your money. Then as you interact with MPs who invest, invested more than, you know, a minimum of 500 million, 
their justification is that this is a business mm. <laughs> and, and they are going to get back their money because they gratuitous at the end of five years for an MP is, is 600 million as of today. But they might increase it. That's beyond the other payments mm. that they get per month. The package at the end of parliament is as of today 600 million. So they say if I invest 500 million, I'm assured of getting it at least at the, as the end of term package. And they also say that since this is a business, they don't mind, you know, registering based on bribery. If you civil society, you want something, you bring money and they will also give you what you want. So we have leadership that is considered as a grand theft a grand public auction, and the element of a social contract has disappeared thanks to President M7 and his permanent presidents. And, and, and I don't know whether that's the fundamental change he promised this country or he thought about. But going back to the basics of economics, if you look at the human index, the human development index in, the, in this country, it stands at 0 0.44 per citizen, the GDP performance index, our growth has shrunk over the last year, maybe because of COVID, and it is estimated to, you know, to further reduce by 4.5 from 7.5 in 2019. Our defense expenditure is, you know, the citizen gets value of 2.05, and we know that in the next budget we have a 6.7 trillion mm. budget for defense. And our population index stands at the, you know, 0 0.59 per the, the global population. So if you consider our public debt, which is above our national budget, because our public debt is at 65 trillion, our national budget is at 44.3 trillion. And our estimated revenue collection is 22 trillion. So you are expecting at most to generate 22 trillion as a, as a nation, 10 trillion of which goes into debt servicing, and you have a budget of a 50% deficit, and your public debt is 65 trillion. So um, seven, President Museven has succeeded. And, and maybe it's important also to, to recall that he has benefited from debt waiver under poor and highly indebted nations globally twice. So we have had public debt of this country cancelled by global euro wishes two times. Mm -hmm. And we are now in a debt crisis with a borrowing rate of 47.2% of GDP. We are 2.5 shy of the red line yeah. as per international borrowing standards. So when uh, President Museven, I'm sure in his speech on, on uh, was it Tuesday? He will, he will be just thumping about economic growth. So Ugandans need to be put on notice that this is negative economic growth because we are highly indebted and we have money to pay, including our children and grandchildren to be born. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Uh, Matanda, so you take three yes. minutes? Yeah, I had already uh, in, in my initial uh, submission, I already hinted on issues of the economy. Uh, so maybe I should go to corruption. You know, uh, when, when the doctor mentioned that uh, our people, the society, celebrates the corrupt and maybe we should not blame the president, it reminded me of a debate I've had with my father over a long period of time, uh, coming from a British saying that a society gets the leaders it deserves. There, there are people who say, and my father is one of them, that corruption is not a problem of the leadership, it's a problem of the society that has degenerated. It's very easy to treat that statement as logical, but I disagree with it because I think that the leadership sets the tempo. If the leadership is as bad as the society, then what job do they have in the leadership in the first place? Because all throughout human history, everywhere where transformation has happened, the leaders stand over and above the limitations of their society and cast a bigger vision and then inspire the people to move towards that vision. So having 
was I think it's, it was number six or seven, elimination of corruption. And the choice of the word is interesting. Elimination. elimination. Not even mitigation Zero. or fighting, <laughs> but elimination. Yeah. And so w when you read that, and then you watch the action is over the years. We recently walked it out of the <laughs> <laughs> you just you, you, you just shudder. It was laughable. Uh, it, 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 it was laughable. <laughs> what people need to understand is that when it comes to issues of values, things like fighting corruption, and here uh, I speak about this very passionately because one of our rallying points as a, a political party alliance for national transformation, when it comes to issues of values, and of which integrity and zero tolerance to corruption is a value issue. Leadership is not replaceable. The leader sets the tempo. There are things I cannot say or do because General Mugisha Muntu was my leader. I cannot say or do this because my leader has set a bar, a standard. When he passed away just recently, uh, may he so rest in peace, President Magufuli, I had even the president here saying, ah, that man was good. We had the eliminated wastage in the government. I say, oh, so he knows it. <laughs> and I thought, I thought he's not aware. <laughs> A leader, the leader sets the tempo. In Tanzania, until he passed away, of course, he also had his shortcomings. Mm -hmm. But on the question of wastage, on the question of corruption, and he had set debate, a standard. And public debt. So if you're a thief and you're there, you organize yourself very fast. You streamline mm -hmm. yourself. So when you take leadership, like when the NRA took leadership in 1986, people observe, people watch. And, and even, by the way, this, this works even in a family or even in a company. When you get a new manager, all employees, on their first day, they will come very early. They want to observe. Is it business as usual, or has something changed? Of course, after a week, they're like, ah, <laughs> back to our factory settings. There's nothing new. Or to say, oh, ha, this guy. Now, the guys who were, for, you know, uh, using underhand methods to get tenders, the forex bureaus in Tanzania were running two books, official ones and, 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 and others. We call them Wapigadidis. Yes, <laughs> they were Pigadidis. Uh, the, 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 the wasteful activities in all ministries. Now, you, can you imagine something like that? Hiring a tent at that amount? We, we got COVID tents every day. at uh, 102 million. 109 million. And yes. they were blown away by wind. Yes, and, and I, I, there's a time <laughs> when I, I saw a, a group appearing before the Public Accounts <laughs> Committee, and in their, in their accountability, they had shown that they hired projectors. <laughs> at 10 million, you know, per day. But uh, that, so, so, so President I'm Magufuli. Hiring a projector. Yes, at 10 million. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. So President, <laughs> Pre President Magufuli, <laughs> President Magufuli, I, I remember we, we ran hashtags here. Mm. Uh, people would say I was going to shower, but then I asked myself, what would Magufuli do? Mm. I decided not to shower to save the water. Mm. So he, he set a tempo of saying, look, we are still a struggling country. We have a very small resource envelope. We cannot afford to be wasteful. So the minister, if, if you're going to travel to this country, should you travel? Why do we have an ambassador there? So when you start to ask such questions before making an expenditure, because the tempo has been set by the leader, then you start to save. But now here, I can tell you, every person who gets an opportunity to inflate a budget, to steal a tender, to do what, will do it because that is the culture. It's now the norm. It's now the, the, the way to go. And finally, as a personal example, I can tell you that the council, I get a lot from people who seemingly care about me, uh, relatives, friends, like the community, what the community keeps telling me is, you, why are you in opposition? People are enjoying, you know, you should position yourself and, you know, get, get something. Mm -hmm. That is the general mentality, yes. Yes. you know, in the country that the citizens have now been reduced to a level where everyone thinks now in this country we are all like thugs. Grab whatever you can, yeah, it's our time to eat. Grab whatever you can and run away. And, Actually, and, one, yes. one person yes. 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 A statement and said he was on the Uganda talk show and said, Ah, ah, and on Uganda, Katujisale will fee fee fee, Buryoma Gavaneco Chagavana, Vana, Ubabali Gisanga, Beva, man. Yes. So, 
uh, in other words, <laughs> let's slice this Uganda mm. into pieces mm. such that each of us can have a share. We don't care whether children find it or grandchildren, but at least for us, when we've mm. eaten a piece out no, of to, to make it more exact, a member of parliament, Honorable Katol Wama, he was on a committee, uh, I think the appointments committee, and Jeno Kaika who appeared there to have his contract approved. So they approved it. When he came out, the journalist asked him, uh -huh, did you people approve? You know, Kale's reign with all these issues. He said, no. I could for Changi. I could for Changi in Uganda, but you're not Fungani or Fungani. Precisely, he was saying, why would I have a problem with him when he's not coming for my position? In this country, everyone should grab whatever they can. I thought you, you okay. have given uh, your, your, your other minutes, but you I, I now have. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> two things. Number one, when you look at uh, the trends of economic growth and um, in, in the economic terms, you can see progression. But when you get down to the level of household incomes, we have a challenge. So I think the challenge for President Museveni and the leadership is to see that this economic growth, economic development that is spoken about by economists and uh, experts is brought down to the level of an ordinary Ugandan. And that's where I think in the 35 years, that's where the di uh, di divergent or uh, um, the opposing views, the alternative um, governments in waiting have had inroads to the population because they, they address issues that even the ordinary person relates to. So to sum it up, otherwise the, the debate is broad. Now, when it comes to corruption, how do you judge a leadership or a government over addressing a certain issue? It's through systems, through structures, institutional <coughs> policy frameworks that they've tried to put in place. If you, you, you look at uh, the 35 years and the, the, the question of corruption in Uganda, I think when it comes to institutions, we have uh, over 80 anti-corruption agencies, institutions that are supposed to address that. Then when you come to policy frameworks, we are very good. But we get back to what Matanda seems to be disputing over with his father, over the kind of society. When you look at this corruption actually over the years, it's like it's part and parcel of our culture as Uganda. Yeah. But, but um, why? Why is it that way? It is because in every sector you, you go, you find it. Truth be spoken, even in the, in the, in the third party voices, the civil society institutions that would be actually addressing this. I, I've had a whole history with the civil society organizations. I've been in charge of programs and, and, and the making, I don't know, proposals. I assure you, dear citizen, you can never get any donation or grant proposal approved in any of the funding organizations without you speaking the language of a kickback. Truth be spoken. So even within civil society, it is the game of the day. And even when you start an NGO today, a, a, a civil society organization that is supposed to highlight and challenge government over such issues, the big brothers, the people seated in that office, they are demanding, they are saying, okay, I'm going to make sure that your proposal goes through, but how about me? So that is how we've sunk, that is how far we've sunk as, uh, we've sunk as a country. And uh, also the other thing, uh, actually right now in Uganda, if you're not corrupt, then you're the old man out. Mm. I will tell you this for a fact. Go to civil service. Go to all the sectors. Go to business sector. Uh, uh, it is the language of that day. They tell you, 
uh, what are you talking about? This is the way we play the game. When you're making quotations for retainer, you have to factor in. Go to our legal profession. I had the opportunity to get into private practice, and I looked at things, I said, my God, can I keep up with this pace? A lawyer is given a case. Someone has a very incumbent free property to sell. Some of us, professionals, private legal practitioners, someone tells you, uh-uh, now, if, if your client just sells it off like that, for you, where will you be eating from? And at night at 3 a.m., they bury a dog and create burial grounds such that now somebody can come and pretend and say, hey, we have a burial ground here and therefore we claim compensation so that we can transfer our dead relatives to a different location. They are all gimmicks of making money. It goes back to one thing. That as a society, moral wise, we've sunk. To address corruption, we can heap the blame to government, but I think all institutions across the board must come into play. The religious institutions must play their role. But here is the deal. How do you task a religious institution when we have a, a, a faith move and a, a religious wave where even when receiving a prayer, you must first give a seed offering before someone prays for you. Mm. Therefore, the anointing of God is sold out before you get it. So this is how far. Is that the creation of President Museven and the RM <coughs> government? No. Us as a country, if we are to address corruption, we must reflect back. And by the way, by way of comparative analysis, recently I happened to cross the border between Uganda and Kenya. The truth is corruption in other countries is even higher than what is in Uganda. What makes Uganda appear as if we are in the worst of the situation because we have mudomo. We speak a lot. Look at the time when they closed down Facebook. I'm telling you, you could get on Facebook and it's as if the world has come to a close down. The moment they released it a little bit, you could see and you could only recall the other song, Who Let the Dogs Out? Woo, woo, woo. The vibe and the noise that was on social media. You could just know that actually we speak so a lot, we unearth a lot of ourselves into the public, and <coughs> that, as I wrap up, takes us to what Aikon made and said, what you hear about Uganda is actually different from what you see when you come here. And he was wondering, why this narrative? Because ourselves, we've created it. I'm not saying that this is not a social ill that we are facing, it is there. We've been victims, both in, in, in whatever operation, business, uh, get, get, getting promotions, getting to somewhere where you should be in life. It, it is a social ill that we must address. But the hype about it also comes back to what uh, Joseph spoke about, somehow insinuated in, on it, the national narrative, the death of His Excellency uh, President Magufuli, when you look at what happened there and the handling of the COVID-19 pandemic, if it was in Uganda, the situation would be different. Other countries have developed a national narrative, a national vision. You cannot, people have been programmed to follow that. They've developed that. We are lacking as a country. Not that other countries are actually well off. Rwanda has its own issues, but the way the national issues are about Rwandans is addressed in Rwanda. It is not the way it is addressed in Uganda. Actually, the challenge right now as I wrap up for Uganda is how do we develop a generation, a country, citizens that have a national narrative, identify themselves, we are Ugandans, and this is how we want to portray ourselves as we also address our internal challenges. The problem we have as a country, we've over been given a 
lot of actually I disagree with my sister Sarah in, in, in her earlier submission. Actually, there is no problem with the freedom of expression. The problem we have is the action that you're going to take out of that expression. But what well, via speaking? Ah, Ugandans, we can speak, I'm telling you. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I would want us to wind up here. Yeah, yeah we are really out of, of way. Uh, uh, it's not because you're, you're the eldest here, yeah, but I think uh, you just... You give me four minutes, I'll just make it two and a half. Three no minutes. Worries. Three minutes. <laughs> yeah. Strict. No, I, I think, uh, uh, Mary, you, you, you're fantastic at uh, helping me Con us contextualize this. The the ten point program was an NRN uh, a template. Um, the context of the conversation is that whether or not they delivered it. In fact, they've spectacularly failed, in my opinion, in all of them. Now, item number seven for Mr. Museveni, the corruption thing. A terrible knock. A terrible knock. Led by him. Led by him for a number of reasons. Two. One. Early days. Those days, starting from junk helicopter. Early days, those days, starting from teachers that were absent. Early days, those days, the privatization so of our national estates, the stuff that UPC built for this country, for our citizens, you know, including our commercial banks, the conversations around uh, Umeme. But they, we, we take it personally because this thing has got huge implications for us. And for me, who's lucky enough to have traveled around the world and indeed traveled around the African continent, I take it very, very personally. I was going to say that actually, young Matando, you're really a big relief that born in 1990, you know, but you've got the capacity to have a conversation with your dad uh, to actually end up agreeing with Mr. Fundamental because I completely disagree with him. I'll give you an example. Mary, there is a senior security officer who was part of President Obote's office, and he told me and a group of young people not so long ago, as Barrow, by the way, before Mr. Seven thinks that uh, they're having some other conversation, was, we, we met at a particular place. This guy was talking about the, Nash, the safe at State House. You know, because we're, having, we're discussing budgets and things like that. You know, monies that State House and President's office spend, not a tiny little penny can go unaccounted for. And Obote's instructions was that even a tiny little penny unspent must be taken back. I have. Uh, now a senior lecturer, I think he's retired now, he's a, he's a, he's an uncle of, of young Damien from Kigezi. He told us sometimes in the early 90s that uh, he was in foreign service and was one of those people who was lucky enough to have traveled with Milton Obote to India. And uh, in that travel, um, the, the, the state visit, um, Indira Gandhi, the then prime minister, um, invited Milton Obote and his entire team to to become her private guests. You know, <laughs> what annoyed or surprised this team that now that we've all these other things and now Indira Gandhi, whatever kind of stuff, whatever monies and other dubious allowances for UOT, whatever kind of stuff, as prescribed, must be returned to the National Conference. That's the leadership. That's taking it from the head. Milton Obote on record, not a penny. He told me in Lusaka 2002, Joe, Twice as president, the instructions I gave to my family and close members of my family, not a single member of my family or close family were allowed to have a foreign bank account. It was amazing, extraordinary. That is leadership. Fast forward some of the things that uh, we're saying because of time. When uh, my good brother Mike Mukula uh, was released, yes, he was lifted by you know, some of the people from his community. You know, Mike is a decent guy. He's a good, you know, a decent guy. You know, but you know what? Some of the, the statements that came, including from Mike, you know, they got me into prison, but they left some of the other big fishes. We all know what these things are all about. These things are led from stop. exemplary leadership. They are the guys who build the culture. Now, if part of the 10 to 1 program was to say, we are part of the new fundamental change, this is what's going to happen, then clearly the guy at the top is commander in chief, some funny, interesting officer was suggesting that Museveni should become a field marshal, field marshal Museveni, you know, designate, you know, he should lead in this thing, but should take responsibility. You can't pick and choose, that's what uh, uh, Sarah was saying earlier. The, the corruption thing is a culture. When I was actually hinting at how I was best looked after 
in Ankole. It was deliberate for Ugandans to know that it was possible in this country to go around and the question of your name and, and, and origin was not an issue. I normally tell young people that once upon a time in this country, <coughs> the best ID to have is a student, you know, <laughs> because it will take you anywhere. You know, all these things have faded off. Now, I, I think it's really unfortunate, but because we don't have time, I'll so like confine it down there. No, there is still an opportunity from Seveni and NRA to change these things. They, they need to lead from, above, from, from the top. I know a lot has been stolen, a lot has been looted. They really need to go to bed. And many of them, you know, they, they flock churches and places of worship, but we do God. They really need to engage their gods and inside conscience to begin to say, that, how can we transit? For the channels we've forgiven you guys, we basically want to have a way in which there's a general transition in a manner in which, you know, we don't, we, we can't. But I think still, some, many of these things possible. No, you fail on every count. Final point, um, as a by the way, on, on security. Um, a good example that I had, there was a country in West Africa where there was an election stalemate and the army was nearly taking over, nearly taking over. And one of the three army officers involved, I was lucky, privileged, met with me and a colleague of mine in London, by the way, and he was telling us the story and said, look, we called the two party leaders. And we told them that you guys, you know what happened and you know the reality about the situation in this country. We are watching, we know, and these are the facts. It's up to you to make a decision. We are walking out of this room. You need, in national interest, decide what you, the two of you guys, and whatever you claim you represent is all about. They came out, the matter was resolved in that way. It will come out in my memoirs. It's real, it's an African country. This thing is possible in this country. You know that country? This country was ruled by dictators in the early 80s when the civil in the bush and we had an elected government here. This country is possible. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ochen. The country is possible, Uganda is possible, and uh, those are the words that we need to keep sharing and hoping. I uh, thank you for being with us today, and I uh, thank you for following the discussion throughout. This has been the longest of our, of our conversation here, and uh, I think we almost uh, took over 35 years of sitting here. <laughs> Almost. The analysis has been the longest and uh, it was worthwhile. I think uh, you out there have enjoyed the conversation and uh, learned quite a lot of things. Let's keep hoping best for Uganda and uh, good evening from here and our viewers. Thank you.